Okay, good evening to you all, and uh, let me welcome you to the last day of January. <clears throat> but at any rate, it's our uh, regular uh, scheduled work session tonight. So um, uh, the agenda is a slightly a little bit different, uh, but uh, we're going to jump right into it. And I'm going to start by asking the uh, town clerk, if she will, to call the roll. Mayor Marshburn? I'm present. Mayor Pro Tem Vance? Here. Councilmember Matthews? Here. Councilmember Dellinger? Here. Councilmember Singleton? Here. And Councilmember uh, Berenger? Here. Okay, thank you. Everybody's present. Appreciate you all being here. Uh, Council, as we, uh, as I ask you to adopt the agenda tonight, um, I've just been asked if I can to maybe um, reverse the presentations and have number two be number one and and number one be number two. So, except for that uh, brief change, um, I will accept a motion for uh, approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. Okay, motion properly made and seconded. No discussion. All in favor, please vote aye. 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 Okay, there's no opposition, so it is so ordered. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this evening we have uh, two very important presentations, and we will begin first. I will begin by recognizing our town manager, Mr. Rodney Dickerson, who has a special presentation to make at this time. Thank you, Mayor, Town Council. Um, well, Tonight, we want to honor one of our employees who's set to retire. Um, actually, today is his last day, and a lot of good um, family, friends, and former coworkers got together um, this afternoon and honored him. And um, we want to um, talk about him a little bit tonight and say some good things about him. Does that make you come up here while I, <laughs> while I talk about you? Is that going? <laughs> All right, I'm going to make you. Stand over here, all right? You gonna be all right? Yeah, I'll make you through it. Okay. If not, I got two right. handkerchiefs and right. you know, I'll just pardon a big cry. All right, all right. <laughs> um, oh, oops, 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 didn't mean to do that. Uh, so, there is so much to be said about Tony Beasley, but it would take a week <laughs> to get it all in. Uh, I first met Tony in 2001 at the municipal county administration course at the UNC School of Government. His personality and his I've never met a stranger approach to life sets him apart from others in the course. He has never met anyone that he could not carry on a conversation with. <laughs> and with that burly voice, you often hear him long before you see him coming. <laughs> oh, and don't be in a hurry to go anywhere. <laughs> Those that know Tony know exactly what I mean. After that course, course, Tony would email classmates stating he was looking to come back toward the triangle. Um, I responded and told him we were looking for a building inspector at the time. So Tony was hired as a senior building inspector in January 2007. He served his stint as the economic development director in February 2009, and then he later returned to the inspections department as the inspections director effective September 2014. Tony was very versatile and able to fill many roles. Tony is a walking encyclopedia Britannica. For us old enough to remember what that is. <laughs> you can ask him anything and he is likely to have a reasonable answer or know someone that can get it for you. Tony, why are my AC lines freezing up? Well, it's likely low on Freon. Tony, my weed eater is not running right. Did you try turning one of those little screws on the carburetor? Tony, do you know this person or that person? Yes. I helped put electrical wire in this house when I grew up working with my dad. And everybody here knows those are true stories. To prove my point, I'll tell you a handful of stories. Tony once drove a van carrying former town manager, council members, and staff on a road trip to visit various town halls, downtowns, and redevelopment projects. It was an out-of-state trip. Um, I wasn't on the trip, but I heard that Tony was driving down the freeway and he would turn his head around to face whomever he was talking to <laughs> while he was driving. As you can imagine, this terrified some of the occupants. Someone finally said, Tony, turn around while you drive unless you have some professional race car experience. And Tony said, well, <laughs> I have driven race cars and taken a few laps around the track. <laughs> Who would have thought? 
I still don't think that made anyone feel any better about his driving. <laughs> Here's another story. During Scotty McCreary's run at American Idol, the town of Garner was tasked with planning the hometown tour. Knowing this was a huge event and would be shown all over the world, we wanted every detail to be perfect. The question of how to provide dressing rooms for Scotty and the musicians came up. We certainly couldn't use the park restrooms. This is where Tony came in. He was able to convince an acquaintance of his that owned the RV dealership two hours away to bring a brand new half a million dollar RV to Lake Benson for several days for our use. It worked perfectly. How many people do you know that could have pulled that off? <laughs> one more story, but this one has a different twist. Sometimes in his haste to be helpful, things don't quite turn out as planned. We were having an economic development meeting in the former town manager's office. The meeting was running long, so we all agreed that lunch should be brought in so we could continue the meeting. Of course, Tony volunteered to go pick up something. He went to a nearby restaurant, picked up the food, and called me on the way back to help hold the door when he returned. To my dismay, Tony had ordered two big pans of barbecue chicken filled to the rim along with the sides. There was red barbecue sauce running down the pans, which meant it had spilled in the car. He had barbecue sauce on his hands and his clothes, and he brought the pans in with sauce dripping everywhere and got it all over the counter. Now, how were seven people huddled around a little conference table supposed to eat a, a full barbecue chicken meal? Sometimes the intentions are great, but maybe it wasn't the best idea, but we did eventually enjoy a delicious lunch. You know, I tell you these stories because that kind of tells you the type of person that Tony Beasley has been since I've known him and since he's been here and many of you know him. He's willing to help out anybody, do anything, volunteer to do, whatever you ask him to do, even if it's not in his job title. Um, we've all enjoyed having him around, the stories, all of the advice he's given everybody and uh, willing to help you do anything. Um, so in closing, we're going to miss Tony's knowledge, conversation, and whimsical demeanor. Uh, you would not find anyone with a heart as big and kind as his. We wish him the best in retirement. Tony, we ask that you enjoy yourself with family and friends and Jerry, grandkids. Um, come back and tell us what a great time you're having. Uh, we'll take time to listen. <laughs> <laughs> Your town of Gar Garner family loves you. Thank you. So. He said he, was, he said he wasn't going to cry, but just in case, I brought him a couple of things. I brought him an a, a umbrella to def deflect the tears, <laughs> a, a, a garner cup to catch him in. I might need that. And then uh, you might need this now, a big, a big drying towel. Yeah, I might, yeah. I might truly need this. Yeah, appreciate Thank it. Thank you. And then, Tony, if... Uh, introduce your family. Yeah, if you don't mind... Um, I'm going to give the council an opportunity just to say a few words before you start speaking, and I do want you to introduce the other folks there. So just kind of be patient there, and we'll we'll, we'll let you say some. I'll start with Mr. Matthews over here if he wants to. I always get comments. picked on, but that's all right. Tony, uh, you're a true friend and a, a true trooper. I've had the pleasure of knowing you for many years, and we know a lot of mutual acquaintances. And it's uh, sometimes I stop by the shop and I say, "Is Jeff in?" No, I said, but it's Tony in. Yeah. <laughs> and normally here, here, we say, come on back. And an hour or later, we get to the point of what I went there to see him about. But we talked about any and everything. And uh, you're such a wealth of talent. And as Rodney says, you've got a kind heart. And uh, you can always be depended on. And uh, I wish you well. And I hope you keep coming back by up here. And, uh, and uh, just enjoy retirement. And... Uh, do a lot of fishing, do a lot of farming down there if you want to, and just whatever comes good. And uh, I wish you well, my friend. Godspeed. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Singleton, anything? Tony, the mayor let us go first because once he knows you get going, we'll probably go to the bathroom <laughs> break at that point. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, I thank you for all of your knowledge, your fast responses, your eagerness to serve. Your kindness, I mean, I mean, the man can talk, he can talk to a telephone pole and get something out of it. I mean, <laughs> but he's always there to try to answer an, a question and try to do his best, but he's so quick. Sometimes I would shoot him an email or text. I can even put the phone down and he's already responded back sometimes. 
uh, and, and many times in our meetings, Tony would be listening, and I'd see on Facebook, the sound's not good, or tell so-and-so to speak up, and he was just trying to help uh, so that what was out there for the public would be the best that it could be. And I appreciate uh, everything you've done for us. You're a good fella, and I uh, wish you well, and hope you get to do the things that you want to do. I'm sure you'll probably be doing some work part-time. <laughs> but uh, take care of yourself, my friend. Thank you. You, you. You've been, your hard work's been greatly appreciated. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Berenger, I'll go to you next. Uh, in a world where a phone call to solve a problem often uh, is responded to with, we'll look into it and get back to you. When Tony says, says that, it's solved before the day's over. There's not a, a long time period to wait. He's got an answer, he's got a solution. And I don't think I've ever seen anybody who could uh, give you bad news or good news with the same demeanor and the same uh, sense of humor, I guess, <laughs> and, uh, and not be angry or upset about anything. He just called a spade a spade. But every time I've ever called Tony for help with anything, I've always gotten the answer to my question plus a little bit more. And, and I'm not talking about him talking too much. I'm just talking about more information. So Tony, it has been an absolute pleasure to work with you and I just don't hope you get very far away. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Dellinger. I'll be brief. Um, <laughs> just in the time I've been here, I've appreciated your, as Councilwoman Berenger said, forthrightness. Um, directness, um, your positive energy, and just your depth of expertise, um, kind of a big personality, and that makes a place feel comfortable and like home. Um, so you'll definitely be missed. Um, and enjoy yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Tony, you and I go way back, even before I was on the council, when I first met you and got to know you really well was when we worked together uh, on the GEDC. Uh, with the uh, with the revitalization of the current agri site and going through the process of understanding uh, what it takes to bring back a tax base and and just your plethora your great knowledge of individuals and in introducing the state federal agencies to us and plus we traveled we traveled from yeah. Boston ch to Chicago uh, to try to bring a tenant to the current agri site and. and and uh, you laid the foundation for, for what we have now with the interest of um, Mr. Stallings who pulled everything together so we could um, have what we have now at, at that location, which is Amazon. So Tony, uh, you, you will be missed. I uh, appreciate uh, all the expertise you brought to us and just your willingness and your, your altruistic heart to, to help everyone out, no, no matter who they are. You'll be missed, my friend. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Tony? Uh, before I call on you, the mayor wants to say a few words. I'm not sure I can add much to uh, to uh, what's already been said. Um, many accolades been uh, given this evening. Uh, many people would say that uh, when you reach retirement, that's uh, that's probably the pinnacle. And so, uh, you know, if you've been climbing all this time, you've reached the top finally, and uh, I congratulate you. I think uh, when I first became a town council member uh, essentially 16 years ago. You, you, I think you were one of the first town employees that I met. Uh, Horton Watkins was the uh, town manager at the time. And um, I think you probably told me your name, but uh, after we chatted a little bit um, <clears throat> and we finally entered the conversation, I went back in to Mr. Watkins and said, uh, can you tell me that man's name? He said, uh, <laughs> he, he talked to me a long time. I want to remember uh, who he is. So, uh, but we've had conversations since then, and I would echo what uh, several have said. Anytime I've contacted uh, Tony and asked about an issue, and there have been several where uh, neighbors were kind of uh, in a contentious uh, argument over a housing uh, issue or whatever, every time I've called you, you've been very prompt in getting back and even sort of taking the lead, actually, in getting back in touch with the with the feuding party sometimes and in your own way you uh you calm things down and made things better so um you've been an asset to our town i commend you for the good work you've done and certainly wish you every success and happiness uh, in the next phase of your life whatever that is so now my friend i'll recognize you um i was going to say three minutes that's what we're going to limit most people well, to I, but, I, uh, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, yeah i um to try to make sure uh, it's all typed out 
<laughs> um, okay. Try to keep me on track and keep more than that, my emotions intact. So first I was going to say good evening and council and mayor. And if I could, I do want a few minutes of personal privilege, if I may. And we've already mentioned it. As everybody said, I made sure I know our nine o'clock bathroom break. So this keeps us well under that, I promise. <laughs> Um, I do want to introduce two people, and then I've got my staff I want to introduce towards the end of this, but I do want to introduce my brother and my fiance, Jerry. Um, they've been great. So I'm going to get back to my speech so I keep my emotions in check the best I can. So council and mayor, first and foremost, I'm blessed, I truly am, to be ending my career in local government here in Garner. I am very humbled to have been able to see this day come in my career especially for those that remember November 2011. So that was sort of the check mark for where things changed and moved forward for me. When I started full time in local government, I never thought in 1984 that I would have a lifetime career in public service. And I didn't, but it's been fabulous. At that time in 84, after graduating college and starting full time in local government, I had worked in Salemburg for Department of Justice and I'd been a deputy sheriff for three years trying to get through college. So, you know, those years are still public service years, but they don't count. But it sort of exposed you to what all you were going to do. But during these 38 and a half years, I've had the privilege to be mentored by just four town managers. That was Duke Wisnett, John Gray with the city of Lexington, Hardin Watkins, and Rodney Dickerson with the town of Garner and only two assistant town managers. And they came late in both of those tenures in both municipalities. And that was Alan Carson and John Hodges. The point of that is stability and commitment that these towns have had by their managers and by the professionals that they had, which, you know, gave me guidance and all. I'm thankful for all the opportunities and the experiences that were afforded to me over these decades because they helped shape who I am. You know, um, both government units and specifically here in Garner, we've been pro-development. I mean, pro-staff development. And we tried to recognize that. And anything that's been done through that was accomplished in the communities was because of the collaboration of all those. But when I was at Salemburg, working for Department of Justice, their assistant director, his name was Ed Bolte, and he told me during my college internship, he said, son, it's easier but better to do it right the first time than to go second class. Always try to leave things better than you found them. And that was when I was in, finishing up grad college there. So that sort of became my mantra in public service. Can we leave it better than we found it? And you're not worried about who gets credit for it. Just leave it better than you found it. So throughout my career, I've been fortunate to have management and town leaders, especially all the town council, that have understood the importance of our jobs. You know, what it means to both of them, getting relevant and knowledgeable feedback that y'all, since y'all spoke already, some of this was there, but knowledgeable and feedback and advice on issues. Um, within the area of expertise of your staff that y'all have here at the town. The residents, the development community, the importance of professional and technical development training and the continuing education and advancement of our profession. The ability to serve on, you've given us the ability to serve on boards and commissions and I appreciate that throughout my tenure, whether it's been nonprofits, volunteer at community and schools, serve on the advisory council for the credit unions, work on ad hoc committees for the General Assembly. You've allowed us that opportunity, which keeps Garner and us in the forefront and allowed us to sort of have an advantage on things to come. So for that, I thank you also. It's easy to forget the inspection industry is a public safety entity. It really is. But that's where, we, that's where we're housed. We're housed in the North Carolina Department of Insurance Office of the State Fire Marshal. All of our staff has to take oath to offices, and that's what it's all about. So what's changed over the last four decades? I go back in 1984, our code books when we entered weighed four pounds. Right now they weigh 45 pounds. That's just to do your basic job. But as I tell everybody, it's really only ounces because now we're in the world of electronics, so 
we have access to the codes with the tablets they have in the field. We have, we, the town purchased them, they're online for our inspectors to use. They all still have sets of code books because everybody likes paper. But we've gone from four pounds over three plus, almost four decades to 45 pounds worth of books just for us to do our jobs. Other examples that changed was um, when I first started, council meetings looked like Wild West saloon meetings because everybody smoked. Smoking was allowed in public buildings. And it reminds you of being in the teacher's lounge for some of us that are really old when you walk down the hall to school and the teacher's lounge smoke rolled out. We, we were there, that's the truth. But I mean, that's what's changed. I mean, think about things that have changed. We had to make presentations of councils. We used an overhead projector and mylars that you made on the, on the copy machine where you ran the clear through so you could show them overhead. We had mimograph things in the offices and fax machines, copiers. Your phones were intercoms. You know, you pushed a button, you had eight lights on so you knew who was on the phone. And you, other than that, you walked down the hall and had to do everything in person. You know, but it's all about change and how you embrace that change and make the best of it. And both in my career, all of the municipalities have embraced change and have embraced technology. And it's allowed us to do a better job. You know, we used to build contractors when cell phones first came out, for those that remember, we used to build contractors for if they went over their cell minute allocations. When we gave you, early on in our career, when we gave you a building permit, we gave you so many cell minutes, because that was back when they charged the town a dollar a minute for you to talk on your cell plan. So we'd say, hey, you're getting a permit, but you ain't got but 10 minutes worth of conversations on a cell phone. After that, we're gonna add it to your bill. You know, to now, everything's done that way on your cell phone. There's no nothing. You know, now we do our meetings with teams. We got staff on teams tonight. We got staff watching, some of my staff's watching, they're out with small procedure, they're watching with Facebook tonight. So, um, you know, it's all changed. If you really think about it, if you ever watch the cartoon, The Jetsons, think about what they predicted when that cartoon was out. Mr. Sprocket, Mr. Spacely would show up in front of George on a big monitor, that's Zoom. Rosie was like the robots in your house, they clean. If you watch Miss Jetson, she was always on a treadmill talking to somebody on the phone, early Zoom meetings. And then you had the dog walker. So, you know, they had the little flip phone that faces came up on. That's our FaceTime that we do today. I mean, so the Jetson sort of set where we came. But, you know, it's still amazing of that technology. So over the years, you know, part of what we did, we always preached to our staff, take care of your family first, and then come in and take care of your community because we're all public service folks. We're here to look after the community. I can say in my career being a workaholic, I didn't always do that. A lot of times my family already knew that, hey, they're calling for a snowstorm, they're calling for this, the power's out, the hurricane's coming. They knew that how to prep for themselves a little bit because I was more worried about taking care of everybody else. But that's part of what we do in public service and part of what our department's always proud of their cell phone also. Um, you know, so with that, as I move forward after today, there's gonna be a new norm. It's gonna be hard not to be engaged and it's gonna be hard not to want to try to help make sure everybody and everything's okay. But I'm to a point I'm ready to take that. I can't ever place a value on the professional relationships that have been created. Like Rodney said, he and I first met at Municipal Admin. But the friendships and relationships that have been across political lines, there's legislators and people that still call to ask me for advice. We've met our Congressman Ross the other day when she was here. You know, she still calls and talks and you know her husband's thing. So local elected state, you know, those things will carry forward me long after I'm gone here. But some of those friendships and relationships will still help the community even long after I'm gone also. Because you know they're still friends of Garner. They weren't just friends of Tony. Also, there are some former staff members that came today um, from Lexington that came today that um, they're online tonight. I knew they were going to be online. I wasn't expecting to see them today, but I do want to thank them um, because, you know, we always say that, you know, sometimes your work family, because that's who we spend more hours with a lot of times than our real family, 
you know, they are closer family than blood family can be. And the three that came today, Nancy, Wendy, and Quentin are that. And I have that same relationship with a lot, all of our staff we have here today. And I'm going to introduce them in just a second for a reason. I can't explain the angst necessarily that I've had to try to decide the job to retire from a job I truly love, because I do truly love it. But I've came to a point that's the right time for me. You know, there's still change, there's still growth, and after, like I said, 39 years, I'm ready to let somebody else handle that load. But I was reminded just a few weeks back that, you know, how do you, look at success you know what are some of the things that you can look at and say you had a successful career for me part of that was that i've hired people that have now retired with 30 years of service i'm still working but they've retired and the one we had one today that was still here she's still working 33 years later from when we hired her so we've always had the ability to find the right people with the shared vision and so as a council, I want to say you have not failed to support me or this inspection department in the town of Garner. You've given us resources to do our jobs effectively and efficiently anytime I've asked. And I thank you again for that support during my career because that has made a difference. So if my inspection department would please stand up. Mayor Council, these ladies and gentlemen here are top notch. Hey, Doug made it. He ain't up there. Um, are top notch. Um, they really are. They're top notch professionals. They strive for excellent customer service. They work hard to not only embrace change because we are, have seen a lot of change and we're still seeing a lot of change. Just look at our community. But they are change agents. They're the ones in the field that are doing it all. And I promise each of you right now, I can tell you, as a promise, it's been because of all of them that I've been able to accomplish anything. Because it's not me. I'm just a person on the bus, and we got the right people on the bus. And so with that, I'm proud of each of you for your work. And I appreciate what y'all do for Garner and what you've done for me, and I applaud you for that. <laughs> Almost there, Mayor. A couple more little paragraphs, and I've done better than I thought. So who remembers the movie or TV show, or, or the little movie that was on TV called Snow Day? Anybody ever remember seeing Snow Day? Snow Day? We're not that old. Well, that's right, you're not that old. <laughs> you know, if you remember the movie Snow Day, you know, it was like, hey, wow, it snowed. You know, so the plow man's trying to get the roads open to get everything back into town, but the, the kids want another day. And what happens during that time frame? If you remember the movie, the little girl decides, that, hey, I'm going to stop them from plowing. And she remembers her brother's superhero collection that's on the wall, and she goes grabs one of the superheroes. And she's using that to try to war off the snow plow. So if you remember that, many years ago I had a town manager give me an action hero and he's right here <laughs> he's called the ee e. man and why it's because he's the exceeds expectations he's the superhero with a cap he exceeds expectations and when the manager gave it to me he said it matched my work ethic and it's been in my office and my desk ever since that manager gave it to me as part of that other process of like you give me something to do, well, what can I do? I need to do it to where I exceed your expectations or exceed my own expectations, which are usually worse than yours. <laughs> so with that, uh, it's time for me as I move on, I want to pass my exceeds expectations thing on to uh, another person in my department because over the last year of preparing a little bit for my retirement, he stepped up. He's done a lot. Y'all have named him interim director. And Paul Padgett, I know, will continue to exceed your expectations as he has mine. And I'm going to give this to Paul to be his challenge as he moves forward. 
with his career to always try to exceed expectations. You hear. Therefore, as I look back over, I can say for my tenure in public service, I can say without a doubt that I've made a difference, good or bad. As y'all said earlier, y'all mentioned some of them to both inspectors that we've done, architects, engineers, other towns and communities. We, the as I said, y'all have allowed us a lot of opportunities. We've had to go assist other communities during state of emergencies, floods, hurricanes, storm assessment buildings they didn't have inspectors that could make inspections and we would send some of our staff to go help them and we've done all that and so i hope that throughout that that most of you will think i've left a positive change in garner and they will continue to be that positive change also tonight is my last presentation before you as the council a formal council meeting and I want to thank you again to the council and my managers for allowing me to be a humble employee all these years. I'm in every one of you's cell phone. As Gray has mentioned, hey, me and him text each other at one or two at night. Rodney will leave a council meeting at 1130 and I'll send him something and go, hey man, that was a good presentation after all. And we'll talk till he makes it to his driveway. Forrest, others, they know. I typically tell everybody, 7 in the morning to midnight, you got me. My number's in your phone. It's still my number. So if you need me or you got a question or you want to grab something to eat one day, you're going to have to wait a couple weeks first, but give me a call. I'm always there to offer support and encouragement to whatever task y'all are taking because y'all have done a phenomenal job. And as I said earlier, Jerry and Stacy, during my tenure, they've been my rock of salvation for me, my rock of encouragement, and I still never get over 2011 when they showed up in the ICU in Indianapolis. I never will forget that. I love you both. So finally, I made it all the way to the end. So finally, to the council and the staff and to my staff and to those watching, I appreciate the opportunity you've allowed me for the 16 years in Garner as part of my 39 years in public service to be a part of this community. And I cherish the community. And as I have said earlier, years ago when we came up with the tagline, Garner is truly a great place to be. And I believe that wholeheartedly. So with that, I say, God bless you all. May you continue to do good things. And I'll bid you a good night. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Tony, just so uh, just so I can just so I can say you didn't have the last word, uh, I'm going to I'm going to say this after tonight's presentation, I don't think I'll ever have to ask again somebody to tell me what's that man's name. I'm going to know I'm going to know you as E E Man. Okay. That's it. All right. God bless you, friend. Thank you, Mayor. Sure. Okay, we'll give folks a few minutes. Those who want to leave at this time. Okay, um, we have one other uh, presentation, recognition. Um, I'm gonna call on Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Mr. Elmo Vance, he's already there at the podium, to read a proclamation that um, is very important. Uh, it's part of a, actually a state of North Carolina um, uh, push this year. And so Mr. Vance, I recognize you now and then we'll recognize folks from Parks and Rec, yeah. A proclamation, North Carolina Year of the Trail 2023. Whereas the town of Garner's natural beauty is critical to its residents, quality of life, health, and economic well-being, and whereas 
The trails that span across our community are an integral part of the recreation and transportation possibilities of our area and promote an enjoyment of scenic beauty by our residents and our visitors. And whereas the park's greenways, trails, and natural areas in our community are welcoming to all and provide a common ground for people of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds to access our rich and diverse natural, cultural, and historical resources. And whereas the town of Garner's natural assets and resources are integral to disaster recovery and resiliency to climate change for future generations. And whereas Lake Benson Park's 1.2 mile loop trail provides visitors with views of the Lake and Garner Veterans Memorial, White Deer Park's one mile loop trail and greenway offer tree covered paths where visitors can find respite. And Town of Garner trails offer spaces for visitors to improve their physical health and mental well being, seek solitude or social interaction, connect with nature, and whereas trails offer quality of life benefits to all as expressions of local community character and pride, as outdoor work workshops for science education, as tools for economic revitalization, as free resources for healthy recreation, as accessible alternative transportation, and as sites for social and cultural events, and whereas the town of Ghana recognized the, important, the importance of providing connections between neighborhoods, parks, and other activity centers, promotes conservation and preservation of our natural resources and works to promote environmental education in the community and whereas the North Carolina General Assembly designated 2023 as the year of the trail in North Carolina to promote and celebrate the state's extensive network of trails that showcase our state's beauty, vibrancy, and culture. And whereas North Carolina is known as the great trail state now, therefore, I, Ken Marshburn, mayor of the town of Garner, proclaim 2023 as the year of the trail in the town of Garner and commend its observation to all people. Okay, thank you. And I'll recognize our parks uh, director, Ms. Uh, uh, Maria, I call her, uh, if she would come forward and you can present that to her and we'll hear comments from her. Thank you. Well, we are delighted. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Good evening. Uh, we are delighted to be part of a statewide coalition that is bringing attention to the beautiful trails uh, that are across North Carolina. And we are immensely proud here in Garner, uh, in our department, to have the beautiful trails at Lake Benson, which are probably one of the most utilized trails uh, in the state of North Carolina. Uh, and then we also have the, the amazingly sort of peaceful and gorgeous and just full of nature uh, trails at White Deer Park. Uh, both are, again, uh, perfect places for people to enjoy nature, to exercise. And we're also excited in the year of the trail, we're initiating the work for another trail, uh, the South Garner Greenway Extension. So it's, uh, it's the perfect year and we're really proud to be part of this. And I'm gonna ask Katie Lockhart, who's our Parks and Nature Superintendent, to tell a little bit about the programs and activities that we have planned to again bring attention to the trails that we have in our park system. Katie? Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Um, so we're really excited about the Year of the Trail. It's an opportunity to celebrate trails and outdoor recreation across the state, and that's what we're about um, over at White Deer Park and with the, the Parks and Recreation and Cultural Resources Department. Um, we have a lot of really fun things planned for this year, <sighs> some things that uh, have been around for a while. We've got the Storybook Trail, of course, Trick or Treat the Trail, which uses the, the loop trail at White Deer Park for trick or treating. Um, but we're adding a lot of things this year. The staff at White Deer, um, Colleen and Allison, have been working really hard on um, night hikes, full moon hikes, um, birding hikes. Uh, we've got a lot of citizen science coming up, so getting groups to come out and um, document different species that they may see, uh, plants and animals. Um, and, uh, sorry, I just blanked on the other thing I was going to share with you all. Please forgive me. 
and then Friday morning bird walks. One of the things that we're also looking at is increased uh, accessibility for our trails. And so we have a group called Birdability that's been looking at um, some of our existing trails to determine if they're appropriate um, for people with all kinds of abilities, whether they're in a wheelchair, whether they're walking, whether they're moving with some kind of other motility device, um, but to really make sure that we're offering something for everyone on those trails. So we're excited and we'll uh, have that information out in the next brochure, and then you'll see new things added throughout the year. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Vance. Um, Ms. Maria, while you're there, we're going to move right into our section of the agenda on the um, discussion and reports. And so the first item of business is um, a presentation on the Jurgen Park Phase 1 picnic shelter concept. So um, I will recognize our Parks Director for that presentation. Right. Well, good evening again, Mayor and Council. Let me open this up. Let me get to the first page. So presenting to you tonight, uh, moving forward with the uh, development of Jurgen Park, which is one of our new parks located uh, not far from Town Hall, right on uh, East Garner Road. Uh, the purpose of this presentation, we have two options that the design team has, is proposing for the large picnic shelter at the f uh, first phase of Jurgen Park. Uh, and our goal is to get your direction tonight on uh, next steps to take on for this particular part of the project. It's so a bit of background, uh, you may recall. Uh, we have been working with Jurgen Park for quite a while in 2021. Uh, in May, the town council approved the master plan Subsequent to that, we uh, initiated the work with the McAdams company to develop the 30% design development, as well as cost estimates and a facing plan, and that work has been completed. Uh, we're currently working with McAdams again to complete 100% of the construction documents, and the initial task in this 100% quest are to develop the picnic shelter design. Uh, and also to have a confirmation of, of the field sizes, because we want to make sure that they're suitable for tournaments, not just for practice. Um, Town Council uh, approved last, I think it was the last meeting, uh, the contract with Balfour Beatty to provide the construction manager at risk services and prepare the guaranteed maximum price so that we can get uh, to the construction phase in an expeditious way once we reach the 100% construction documents phase. Uh, we also have been looking for additional resources uh, to augment or to leverage uh, the investment that the citizens of Garner are making in these parks. Uh, we secured a grant from the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources through the uh, Parks and Recreation Trust Fund. Uh, and we also continue to apply for other grants, again, to leverage the funding that the citizens have uh, approved. As I said earlier, McAdams is under contract to complete the design of phase one. Uh, there's only one vertical structure in phase one, and that's the large picnic shelter. Uh, but the design concept should also be suitable to be adapted as we move on to phase two in the future, uh, that there's a family of design that really works well for the site. Um, we asked them to connect the design to the agricultural history of the site. You know, this was a it's a very visible location. It's uh, in historic downtown Garner. And the theme of the master plan was the peaks of preservation. The design team provided four options. They're the same sort of aesthetic family. Uh, we presented them to the uh, advisory committee and to the administration to narrow down to the two options that we're bringing for your uh, review uh, and feedback tonight. The first concept is called the fan. Uh, and uh, this particular shelter will sit uh, in the sort of very uh, early part of the park, uh, in front of the play area between the two, um, between two soccer fields. And this is what you see here, sort of the location to give you a sense. Uh, very close to the parking, very close to the entrance, and the shelter will serve as the gateway, again, to the play area that will be uh, in this phase one. This is the floor plan that the architects are proposing for this particular concept. It's sort of a semi-loon. Uh, it sort of takes inspiration in the sort of uh, semi-round space that is the play area. Uh, and it proposes to have, again, two separate uh, inserts for the restrooms. Uh, we know that parks 
uh, where families attend tournaments need to have a good number of restrooms uh, as well as picnic tables so that the families can enjoy the time while the kids are in competition. Uh, and then these are sort of conceptually the views that you would see one from the parking area. Uh, in this particular fan concept, I think that the title of this concept uh, sort of refers to the roof lines that they're proposing. Um, and then the view from the play area. And I should point out at this moment uh, that the red and the sort of beigey gray uh, um, forms that you see here are not necessarily the finishes that they will be proposing. This is really for the, um, to look at the form uh, as well as the layout, not so much the, the finishes. Uh, that would come later after a concept has been approved. The second concept is what they call the branch. Uh, this one sort of is also inspired in the sort of the way different viewpoints will take uh, for this particular shelter. There's an entrance, but there's also sort of in that angular shape that they're using here. Uh, one looks at one of the sports fields, one looks at the other one. Uh, some of the smaller ones are sort of looking towards the front of the, uh, of the park. That was sort of their approach to this particular one. Uh, this is the layout. This one is, uh, has the, the bathrooms or the restrooms are a little bit more separate uh, than they were in the other iteration. Uh, and again, sort of picnic table spaces. Uh, the different views from the parking area. This one also has an entrance, but as you can see, the peaks of the roof lines are not as noticeable or as dramatic as they were in the other version. Uh, side by side so you can get a sense of, of the floor plans. And then sort of a quick summary. Uh, the fan is about 4,500 square feet uh, and it has about 1,700 square feet that are specific for sort of the gathering space. It has a larger entrance, much more noticeable, and the restrooms are closer to the seating area. The other approach, the branch, um, is a little bit smaller. Uh, slightly over 4,000 square feet, but it has more square footage dedicated to the activity space, to the picnic area. Uh, and it also moves the restrooms to the edge and not as close to the active space to provide some additional privacy. So our next steps, again, we want to get your direction on the preferred option or approach that you would like to see in this particular project. And pending your guidance on this, we will notify the design team to continue their work with a picnic shelter. Um, just as a frame of reference, these are existing picnic shelters uh, at Centennial, Creech Road, Garner Rec Park, um, as well as White Deer and Lake Benson. And this was not in what I sent earlier. I just added this uh, as a frame of reference. <coughs> and then Mr. Um, Singleton, uh, we received an email from a citizen that had some questions and concerns, and he shared a link to that he had done some research, uh, and Mr. Uh, Singleton had asked that we bring that and have it available tonight. Uh, and I think that's my last slide, so with that, um, I send it back to you, Mayor. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I think the way I'm gonna proceed from here is to uh, uh, ask council to uh, make any comments and or ask questions of you after your presentation. Uh, I think we had one person, uh, we had a sign-up sheet tonight, uh, maybe who who wanted to uh, speak. And so um, we will <coughs> seek to make sure people abide by our three-minute uh, time frame since uh, we want to move along as expeditiously as possible. But uh, Council, uh, I'll start with Mr. Vance to my right to uh, See after the presentation if you have any questions uh, for uh, Maria. I have no questions at this time. Okay. Mr. Dellinger, anything? Okay. All right. Ms. Beringer. I do have one question. Since that park is part of the historic downtown area, it doesn't seem to me that the two plans that we are seeing blend into the historic, uh, um, what do you want to call it, design. And so I'd just like to have some more discussion about that. Okay. 
you might make a general comment and then we'll let others ask her a question or were you wanting to hear from her? Uh, I mean, I, later. Okay, all right, all right, thank you. And yeah, Mr. Singler. Well, if you give me the chance, I could stay here and talk as long as Mr. Beasley should do if you really want me to. <laughs> I'll I start prefer you and not. let it come back around. All right. And um, just, uh, this is just, uh, I don't like either one of them. I've emailed staff, they know my displeasure. These are not attractive at all, I'm sorry. They're just not. Uh, I've looked at other shelters. I uh, went out tonight the other day and looked at theirs. I'd seen it on Mr. Delner sent me a picture, so I went today and naturally went range when I get out there, but and looked at where their stage is at Nightdale Community Park, which is very nice. Um, this is going to be the main structure for years because, I mean, it's going to take us a while to get phase one done. Of course, we know how much it costs. It's going to be a long time before we get to phase two, I think we all understand. And this is like the showpiece. I mean, when Lake Benson Park was done, the only thing at Lake Benson Park was, just, was the path and the shelter. That was it. And, you know, I, I remember it long before I was on the council, but that was entertaining television. Watch that town board go back and forth about that shelter for weeks. Um, a little bit of history. That was supposed to be part one. The other is supposed to be a part two. There was supposed to be a, one connected. That's why the awnings on the end, they were supposed to connect. But they only built part one, so a little history there. Anyway. Um, I, I look at, I don't like, I don't like the fan, I, I don't like, in the, the second one, I mean, we talk about development coming before us and breaking up roof lines and not having blank walls, and right there we have no broken roof line, you have a little bit of point at the entrance, but the view from the, the, uh, uh, the play area is just Can you pop that one up? flat thing, and uh, the walls, I, I look at the bathrooms, uh, especially the second one, um, you know, we, we, sh we don't need to have the bathroom doors coming out right at the picnic area. I mean, on, on one of them on the branch, the doors are right at picnic tables. I, I don't think any of us have bathrooms in our kitchens or dining rooms right beside where we're eating. They, they, uh, I'd like to get the bathrooms on the back side of this and the front side of this being something that when people drive in and see, it looks, oh my gosh, that is very impressive. And the bathrooms are on the back side. And when you build a house, you don't put the bathrooms at the front door. We didn't put bathrooms in here for a reason. Um, it's just, we, we've got to get something that blends in. I reckon, I saw the red, and Maria addressed that in the email. She said these are just concepts, so you can clearly see it. But I thought, you know, there's a barn there that's red, but there's just one barn. I mean, I don't really think we're hanging all that. And the, the house in the back does have a red roof. Mm -hmm. uh, that was redone. Mm -hmm. But um, I just don't think we're hanging, hanging our hat on a, on a red roof. I, I just, I, again, I, I'll go back. I showed this to my wife and son last night, and in just a few minutes, they gave me numerous comments. I won't get in, all into, but, um, you know, I look at what Lake Benson Park is, and when it was, people thought it was, you know, over the top, but it's really a really cool shelter. <laughs> it's very functional. Um, we've got to kind of blend something that takes the history of that area, but also make it somewhat modern. It's like this building. When we did town hall, the consultant and, and our manager at the time wanted this to be very modern and it was supposed to match the library. And the council said, we're not gonna do that. And we came up with something that was different. It didn't match that, but it matched the brick in the neighborhood. And we had the, the structure at the front and uh, so it gives a little modern look, but that's what we discussed. We took that recommendation and molded it and you know, people really like it. So um, I just think we need to punt and start over. That's my opinion. I'll be glad to sit and meet with staff and show you what I'm, I'm talking about again. There's just little things like just the bathrooms are so prominent at the front, it's just a blank wall. I just, that just should not be what people, when they drive in, should see. It should be a structure that comes around the front, the bathrooms, if they can be placed at the back, where they're kind of, they're not out of the way because you can see them, but they just not, should not be the first thing that we see. Um, I'll stop and go on round two when it comes around. Okay. Uh, Mr. Matthews, I recognize you. A lot of good comments. Uh, uh, just just one observation I think we're looking at that is as we found with the other parks we never have enough picnic tables so whatever concept we do come up with I think we need to make sure we have plenty of picnic tables as we can because they do get you guys know better than I do they, they get booked and they're widely used mm -hmm. so uh, we'll figure all this concept out I'm sure so I just want to throw that little part in thank you Okay, uh, before I go back with another round with the council, I'll ask uh, Maria if there's any particular comment she wants to make at this point or we'll hear further. Um, we wanted to get your feedback and to really sort of bring that back to the design team 
uh, in terms of layout, we certainly want you know for it to be a practical uh, layout that would really sort of allow for uh, for a lot of picnic tables for family engagement. Uh, also thinking that if there's a tournament, it would be nice to sort of have two teams uh, have their own little space uh, if at all possible. Uh, so that's why we're sort of thinking that the layout of the branch, even though the bathrooms are certainly in an awkward uh, location, we like the way that one sort of provided almost like two shelters in one uh, in that space. But we will go back to the design team and provide this feedback. Uh, we'd love to sort of get a sense from the council of, you know, when, when uh, Councilwoman Berenger talks about um, historic references, uh, materials could be part of what addresses that. So we'd love to hear a little bit more from, from council as to, you know, what, what materials you envision this to have, uh, some of the forms that you would like to see uh, so that we can uh, give the design team that input and, and sort of get them to, to um, bring us uh, an alternative concept. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I'll start back this way, um, and I'll start with you, Ms. Berenger, this time and go that way if you. One question for now. Did the design team look at the shelter at Garner Rec Park? Uh, that's in close proximity, and it seems to me that the, the theme, if we could carry that theme through to some extent, I, I know it's not gonna be exactly the same, and it's not appropriate to be exactly the same, but um, that park, that shelter is not terribly old, uh, and we do want to preserve the historic um, significance of the Jurgen property in total. Uh, yes, uh, they did go, uh, they visited uh, our parks. Uh, they uh, also walked the farm, uh, or the Jurgen property, I should say, uh, to again sort of, um, but, but we can sort of send them now more specific direction. The um, Gardner Rec Park is the one on the top right corner. Um, yes. Um, and that one's a, that's a larger shelter. It accommodates about 75 people. So it's a nice, uh, and it is one of our newer ones. Uh, Mr. Dellinger. Yeah, I, th I think it, <coughs> I was reading through the comprehensive plan this weekend, and there was a part that jumped out the implementation where it says display community values and pride through our architecture, landscape design, and public art. And I think with Mr. Singleton's point with such a prominent structure, it's worthy of that investment of inform, but also capturing those historical elements and being a show piece. I think, you know, the agricultural nature of the park lends itself to sort of more of a barnish, higher roof line, being suggestive of a barn, but not looking like a barn. Um, there are a lot of tin roofs and, uh, I think it just needs to be a little grander uh, without being ostentatious, I guess. It's, it's, you got to find that right balance. Um, so I think it just the, the branch layout, I think, lends itself more to is more square footage. Uh, and I, I do have some concern about the location of the bathrooms. Um, they're, they're actually better against the road than against the play area because then people can't see the play area, so I'm not sure how we can reconfigure it to push them out to the to the side further, so there's more of a bigger entrance in the middle. Um, but I think we want to create something that's representative of the history, um, and 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 doesn't look just kind of. I mean, these the ones up here now; those are smaller shelters. They're just in a park. This is a, kind of a larger Lake Benson type of park, so it's worth that investment, I think. Okay, um, Mr. Vance. I would just echo the reference to what has already been said briefly in reference to uh, the historical aspect, kept capturing that the character uh, of the district that is in the historical district more so than it is doing now. Other than that, I don't have any further questions. That's it. Okay. All right. Um, just, I think everything's pretty much been said. I would agree with, and uh, so what we can come back with. Okay, all right. Second time around. Anything further, Mr. Singleton? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. 
a reminder. I, if I'm, I'm almost sure we had this conversation. We talked about the soccer fields. There's going to be there's going to be a fence in the line there. There's going to be fences here breaking all this up because the mm -hmm. balls come over and all that. And we don't want kids, of course, running out there. Yep. Um, something I think we should consider. I'm getting a little bit tad off this. Is uh, Marie? Can you go to um, the the concept to the branch? One of the first slides. Um, right there. That one that says uh, number eight. Yes. I think we should consider putting a small shelter down near the end of the teardrop. Uh, I remember how the two small shelters got Lake Vincent Park. We had a town council meeting down there. We talked about what we were going to do. That's when it was just one shelter. Staff had recommended the one on the right. Some of us wanted smaller shelters. I held the stake that Mr. Montgomery drove the stake in the ground for the one on the left is, and Mr. Sample went out in the woods and put that one there. That's how the shelters got where they are. And we helped pick out those little designs. Um, I, I would think of a shelter. Some people may want to get away from the crowd. With small kids that may be, you know, crying or upset or whatever. Uh, I think a, a small shelter or two of that down there would be an appropriate place. Again, I get back to the fact this is going to be the grand structure that people are going to see for years. And uh, I had no trouble with the bathrooms blocking the sight line. If they want to see the game, they'll go down there and see the game. I'm not worried about that. I just don't think bathrooms should be at the front door. We talked about putting extra bathrooms at Lake Benson years ago. And they were going to go at the front right as you came in, but just before the Veterans Memorial. And I had a citizen call me and talk to me. And she said, that's when we went to, do you put the bathrooms at the front door of your house? I was like, no. They said, well, why would you go first thing to park? There'd be a structure there for bathrooms. It's like, good point. I said, what about the other side over there where the gazebo is? Same thing, you never put bathrooms down there uh, at that place, at, down at that part of the park. So I, I just, uh, we need to, again, punt and start over. Uh, I just, I think there are other structures that could, that could look grand but not be overbearing. We got to think how big that house is that it's going close to. That's a big house. And uh, so with something with some height that's not hurt, having it down there, that, that'll stand out. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, as, as low key as these. And again, it's just, when you look at the shelter again from the view, it's just a mass of, of a shelter. It's just a mass of a roof. Nothing breaks it up. It's, again, we tell developers they got to come here and break up this and break up that. And uh, those, those walls against the parking lot, that's just, that's just not a good look. That's boring and uh, just not very appealing to what we're trying to bring here. And then, of course, it, when we get to phase two, whenever that happens, whoever's on this council will deal with that issue. And uh, that'll be another discussion, but we got to get this right. And um, I don't, I don't think either one of these concepts are right. I think we need to start over. Um, Ms. Maria, I have uh, just a couple of questions. Um, with these, these fields won't have uh, bleachers along the sides of them. Is that correct? Uh, typically, for this, um, for the sort of practice and, and game fields will have portable bleachers. They will not be permanent. Um, and many times what will happen in tournaments is that parents and family members will bring their own chairs. Right. Uh, so it'll be probably a combination of a few movable bleachers uh, and then sort of open seating um, for people to bring their chairs, which is you know what typically happens. Um, phase two will have this sort of what they call championship field that will have permanent bleachers, but that's sort of again phase two in the future. Okay, and um, I think also maybe I'm getting ahead of the discussion, but uh, so there will be um, well, it kind of fields, but some turf fields and some um, uh, regular grass fields, right? Yes. The uh, the current plan uh, is to have two natural grass fields and two artificial turf fields. Um, okay. Again, to sort of allow for, for both weather conditions. The natural turf fields cannot be used when there's a lot of rain. Uh, even with the best drainage, there will be times that it'll be too muddy to play. Uh, and then you do have on the other side, the artificial turf, if it's excessively hot, uh, they can get very, very hot. So uh, we think that by having both options, we'll certainly expand the opportunities for, for play. Okay, yeah, I know we talked about that before, and that seems reasonable, and, and this is maybe a silly question. Will, will the turf fields be together and then the grass fields? They yes. won't be interspersed, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. Um, okay, uh, let's go around one more time. Mr. Vance, I'll go back to you. Uh, uh, just to, I think another shelter at the end of the play area makes sense. I think looking at the master plan as well, 
there's the area right across this road that's sort of an entrance to the paths. There's open area there where there could be some small, one or two smaller shelters. I think you, can, you can't have too many shelters, um, particularly when you have a lot of people out and they want to find some place away to eat or you know just go and hang out. So that area right across the street is large enough for at least one small shelter. And it's in that that side of the park. We have a lot of shelters on the other side of the park, a lot of small shelters, but we don't, we only have the large shelters on this end of the park. And so I think we need to add some more um, for that phase one and kind of find little pocket places um, for those. Um, But that's all. So so thank you. Vance, I'll get back to you or am I going this way? Okay, excuse me. All right, it's okay. Anything further here? Uh, one thing uh, I touched on there, a couple of things. One, having coached for several years, the, the bleach garner's lucky. We have bleachers at South Garner, and also we got benches added after a couple of years. Many of the other places you go don't have the benches. As Ms. Rhea said, you bring your own chairs. Right. Um, the artificial, the, excuse me, the turf fields um, have a drainage system also. So that's all built into it. And they do get hot. She's right, you got the black beads in there. And if it's an ni- upper 90 degree day, they hold heat. I mean, we had a tournament at the main field at Castle, uh, and on a, and it was so hot that we, we had 10 minutes, played for 10 minutes, stopped for, for five. It was so, it was in the upper 90s, and they are like playing on fire. And that's the one advantage the grass doesn't have, I mean, it does have, but when it's raining and they can want to practice, and you have to cancel practice, the turf gives you that opportunity. But uh, yeah, anyway, yeah, hopefully having two, Having more multi-purpose fields is what we need. We all know that. Right. So um, anyway, uh, exactly. I, th- I thought I think Ms. Dunn's was bringing up the, the, a small shelter or two uh, across the road. I think that's a okay. appropriate too. Mr. Matthews. Uh, sort of a little bit of a right turn, Maria. I know we removed the splash pad and the special playground away from this to White Deer. Mm-hmm. Is that somewhat going to come in along the same timeline here, or, or we am I getting ahead of myself here? Uh, oh, well, I mean, it's construction. It's unpredictable in so many ways, um, even though you plan for it. Um, I think we, well, we have uh, the design t- uh, contract is in place for the White Deer improvements. Uh, so we'll start working with that design team uh, in the next month or so. Uh, and if all goes well and there's no uh, sort of unexpected surprise and obstacle, I foresee that White Deer will be finished first. Uh, it's a smaller project, should be sort of expeditiously designed. Uh, we still have about um, 10 to 12 months left of design work in this particular at Jurgen Park. Uh, and that just has to do with, I mean, there's a road, there's sidewalk, there's East Gardner Road uh, that we have to address. So this one's a bit more, more complex. Uh, it's also, I mean, White Deer has been developed. So a lot of the permits that you, we may have to get here, we may not have to get at White Deer. Um, so, Okay. That's and that also the, the all accessible playground that's going to be built at um, White Deer. Yeah, yeah, all that tied in and the splash pad. Mm-hmm. All that's going to be tied together. Should, okay. Yeah, I, I remember in our, our capital projects update we got last with Ms. Harrison that it, yes. that this, hopefully those two are built b- beforehand. Yes. Before right, this. I mean, they, they might be built complete before we break dirt out here. I mean, when you say Don't tied say together that. as far as timing, but they'll be in two separate. Areas of the yes, park. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I just yes, want to yes. make sure that's but, I mean, but, but yeah, they're not. But they're doing the design at yeah. the same time. Mm-hmm. Yes. yes. Okay. While uh, while council maybe is uh, is thinking and contemplating, um, since uh, this is kind of a different type of a hearing this evening, certainly not a public hearing, but um, I indicated earlier, and I think we had a sign up sheet. So uh, as I understand it, uh, we have is Miss Katie. Am I pronouncing your last name right? It's Cardenas. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, Ms. Parks, did you sign up or? Would you? you I, I need you to come to the uh, to the podium there, so we can hear you better. Moved on to the next. And remember our three minute. Yeah. Oh, I, I, just a comment. And Gray may have already touched on it because this is one of the things since this is 
park development. I was wondering if you guys were considering, Gray, and you may have already mentioned it, uh, accessibility for disadvantaged folk, because a lot of people talk about that. But you know, you got one in Clayton, and you got someone, another one somewhere. But I think, Garland, we're talking about a premier community. I think it's important for us to consider that. I know that the demographics of our organization is probably 50 and above, but there are instances where a lot of other people do come in, and people do look for those kind of parks where kids can come and they can still enjoy the amenities of Garner, whether they, whether they, they live here or not. But I'm glad that you guys are at least considering that, talking about disabilities. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Parks. Mr. Manning. You want <clears throat> well, Maria if I, to just talk about what yeah, the elements of the absolutely, playground yeah. is going to be? Yeah, if be I can just, um, sort of address your question, and thank you for bringing that up. Uh, the park, the project that you uh, heard of talk about, White Deer, it's actually intentionally an inclusive playground uh, to provide children with all abilities with the opportunity to play. Uh, play uh, has a tremendous role in the development of children. Um, that's how they learn. Uh, so we want to make sure that, again, children have uh, access, and, and that is the sort of the intent of the project that we're developing at White Deer. Uh, but also, uh, as a frame of reference, uh, in this particular park, we will have, we will make sure that it is accessible. Uh, one of the things that in talking to a mom, um, that was talking to me about as a mom when she brings her child who has disabilities, who is older, uh, a, a larger uh, changing room table would be important for her. So that's the level of detail that we'll be paying attention to uh, in both parks. So thank you for bringing that up. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, we'll go at least one more round if you want to. Um, let's start back over here. Feel anything else? Great. Okay, yeah. All right. Down here, down here. Okay. Um, Speaking of uh, uh, what Ms. Parks brought up there, is, is it the park there, right there, close to the senior center that has a, right. a designated area, doesn't it? It does. The, the park, uh, uh, Garner Rec Park, yes. has a dedicated playground for uh, handicap accessible for okay. special needs children. Mr. Vance, you were part of that committee to begin with to bring you're, that part there. You're speaking of the Hope Park right beside the senior center. Mm -hmm. that, yes, was the, that was the initial intent because during that period there was not a place as mentioned by uh, Ms. Parks where it was actually uh, uh, designed for those with, with those special needs to be able to come out and play. Uh, so that one was a town uh, private public private partnership to build that one some years ago in which it was uh, have the uh, the amenities and also the uh, the, the playground was uh, be able to bring in the wheelchairs. Although it was not a hard surface, it was a surface in which they could come back and forth relatively easily. And that was the initial intent of it to provide a playground that would be accessible to all those with all all disabilities. I guess is that our only park that specifically has a segment built for that purpose? I think right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, well, we're not finished yet, but uh, before the, uh, I guess before this uh, ends tonight, uh, Ms. Blanco, you're looking for um, the council to uh, basically uh, uh, approve the preferred concept for a large picnic shelter, is that right? Well, to, to give us direction on next steps, uh, yeah. and if, if the recommendation uh, was, you know, this is an option that you can approve, but the other option is you can sort of direct us to go back and uh, an updated design to be more reflective uh, of the various comments that you have made. We can give that instruction to the design team and then bring back to you or, or um, get you the information as to what changes could be made. Okay. I, I would just uh, be interested to know if, if that's what we do, uh, do you have a, a time segment that you think the, it would take to do that and, and get it back before council? Well, um, they started working on this concept sometime in late November. Uh, so I would assume, you know, about six weeks, give or take, uh, seems to be. Uh, but it'll depend on their own sort of workload and, and our contract with them to make sure that they can uh, bring okay. us back into the process. Absolutely. All right. Um, let's see. 
you you were making the the, the main and only presentation, right? It, there's there's nobody else from the town staff that uh, was gonna. No. Oh, okay. All right. So, okay, back over here. Any further comments to uh, to Maria, or questions? So okay. Okay. Start over. <laughs> I'm serious. I, I, just, I, don't, I had to meet with you and talk. I had to start over. This is just not going to cut it. Well, I, I guess I'm not clear, uh, Council, if the, you know the, the the two concepts presented with the fan and the branch, is is that? We don't like them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> don't like either one of them. Okay. I mean, we were talking about a shelter, and I know a shelter is is an element of that, but I thought uh, maybe. In terms of the concept um, and its shaping and, and, and so forth, that uh, this is more than a shelter. Keep remembering that. Yeah, well, this yeah. is the focal point of this park for years. This is where the people are going to come to. It's more than a shelter. This isn't yeah. something we're going to throw up and throw up. I mean, you know, just it's got to be better than what we've, we've got here. I'm sorry. Just there's got to be something. Well, I, I guess the only reason I raise that is I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, but you know, we, we certainly talked about. I think another area that's going to be uh, a pretty part, it's not, it's not going to be part of the recreation area, but you know, the, the old house and the building there and the pecan groves and those things are going to be a pretty significant place that uh, people will see as they come to that area over there. They may not if they don't come there specifically to see that, but I'm saying that that within itself will capture, I think, some of the, uh, maybe the history we're talking about and, and an area that's unique and, and Part of our history. Yeah, it will, but the shelter is going to be closer to Garner Road, and that's going to capture attention first. The other buildings are set back. Yeah. And so we want to be sure that, um, that what's closest to the road is that makes the best impression it can. Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Mayor. I, I think we got direction to look at some more concepts, go get back with the architect, uh, take the feedback we heard tonight, and just um, come back with some more ideas. I think, I think yeah. that's where everybody is right now, and we're... Yeah going to go do that so all right yeah so i don't i don't think i think all the council's in agreement with that so i think yeah yeah Long it here uh, yeah. unnecessarily yeah okay council everybody clear on uh, on the how we're proceeding now this time and maria you too thank okay. you okay all right thank you very much thank you okay all right uh we will now go to uh, item two under discussion uh, zoning text amendments um Mr. Treasenberg, our planning director, will present on this issue. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Um, good to be back in North Carolina. I hope you all didn't miss me too much. You were gone a long ways away, weren't you? Um, well. A little, little, little much overdue Caribbean vacation. So that was Good for you. that was nice, um, mm -hmm. but glad to be back. Um, and I understand that there's been some uh, further discussions, and I got a recap of um, the planning commission. And just up front, I do want to um, apologize for what were probably a few more oversights in the staff report than what we would normally have hoped for for the Planning Commission. Um, unfortunately, that was just a combination of trying to get ready for two meetings um, before I left and Mr. Bamford trying to do his best to um, step in but not having been personally in attendance at some meetings. Mm -hmm. um, but we've, we've reconvened um, once already as a staff since we've gotten back and um, are meeting again next week and with Sarah now on board as well. Um, we also had a, another new employee start today that we did again, or she started yesterday. Yesterday, I uh, didn't want to make her come to this first meeting right away, um, but some of you may know her. Um, she's actually been a part-time employee over in Parks and Rec. Um, her name is Burnett Brown, um, and we'll have her before you to introduce you formally to her um, but she is now our front kind of front facing planning technician position so for the first time in a long time um, we are almost 100 percent full um, just the transportation position which uh, may be a challenge but um, hopefully we will have um, 
more time and capacity to focus on uh, some expansion of efforts in our department as opposed to just trying to maintain um, our core work duties. Um, but I did just want to pr provide a little bit of an intro again um, to this discussion. I know you all have a lot um, I'm sure that you want to contribute. Um, but I just want to say again, um, I think all of us hopefully are trying to keep these overarching goals in mind. Um, that you know, one of our goals is that we do want to have an early and robust conversation about project proposals um, and have those conversations with the impacted communities. Um, another, though, is to provide a predictable and readily understood review process for the property owners and their development partners. And so together, um, I would hope that we would all agree that um, we hope to have both the impacted community and development partners on both sides engaging each other in good faith throughout. Um, so again, just a little bit of, of history, um, again, for those who may be watching this for the first time. Um, under the previous UDO, the mail notice requirement was stated that it was property owners within 300 feet. Uh, this was a fairly simple GIS calculation. However, there were two caveats which made it much more complex. Um, where rights of way are, were wider than 300 feet, thankfully, I think the only one of those was I-40. Uh, we staff would have to manually include abutting parcels on the opposite side of the right of way. Um, but then there was the more complex one, which could easily uh, be misinterpreted or misapplied. Uh, there was a requirement basically to manually examine in every direction possible radiating from the subject area that if only one parcel existed within that buffer area, uh, then we would have to highlight that parcel and then manually include every other parcel not already selected um, to add it to the mailing list. Um, and there was just no, no convenient way to try and automate that kind of, of procedure. And it was prone to easy differences uh, in opinion on what, what was affected and what wasn't. We talked a little bit about this, the UDO draft coming out of committee. Um, there really was not any consensus on either the distance or the owner-occupant matter. Um, the consultant struck the problematic sentence, however, the one that I was just talking about that said, if the notice only includes lots immediately adjacent, the mailing would be extended by one lot uh, beyond the required notice area. After that, um, as place, kind of a placeholder, um, they did have the uh, address within 300 feet. Uh, they did change it, uh, some of the wording, so that it would also include the occupant of a single family property. Uh, the way that they identified the parcel um, site address, and I can show you how that looks in the county IMAP system uh, here as well. Um, but then they also put in at some point um, one of the ideas that had been talked about um, even before the UDO rewrite got started about a parcel being part of a larger subdivision that if one parcel was included, then the entire subdivision should be included. Um, and the subdivision part referred to a specific county GIS layer um, that has morphed over time. And there's some discrepancy, uh, there's, or I should say there's not much consistency in how they apply the term subdivision. Uh, in some cases, they may apply it to a phase. In some places, they may apply it to a re-subdivision. Sometimes they condense it all into one. Um, but that's where we got into the concern of, particularly like in the instances of Heather Hills, um, that area, that whole subdivision, when you include all the phases together, goes for over a mile. Um, so if one, one parcel is included on one end or a small number of parcels are included on one end, um, including the whole subdivision, uh, would probably be deemed excessive. Um, so staff comments uh, to the consultant were that we really wanted a flat distance. Um, not having to manually select parcels was highly desired. Uh, we did discuss distances of all the way up to a quarter of a mile. Um, those were some of the things that were thrown out on the table. Um, there was, uh, we did also notice that there was commentary 
in the UDO mentioning, mentioning that it was a best practice to mail the HOAs um, if the subdivision was impacted as kind of an alternative um, to that. And also, uh, there was considerable discussion again, um, as we've talked about before too, that notifying occupants of properties containing multiple dwelling units, such as uh, duplexes and apartments. Um, there have been some GIS limitations uh, to that as we've been going through these discussions, and I'll point that out to you on IMAPS as well. Uh, but the county has been actively involved in an addressing update project. Um, and that literally is, has been changing um, every few months as to what capabilities we have and don't have. So the final draft uh, when it came out uh, was that property owners' ad addresses and property physical addresses uh, within 1,000 feet, again, a simple, straightforward GIS calculation. Um, so it would include occupants of single-family properties uh, was presented at the final joint committee and the, all the steps of the public hearing review process. And so that's where we are today. A question, though. That's yes. not what the UDO says. That, the, so, what the, you, go back one slide. And I've got, I'm making notes as mm -hmm. fast as I can write. That's not what the current UDO says. So it says the property, the property, I can bring it up exactly. But it does use a term in the IMAP system that refers to the parcel's physical address. It says owners and tenants in the UDO. Anybody else have that in front of them? I have to, I know. Uh, I mean, it was in the original rewrite text amendment change. It was the thing that caught my eye was that the video as written says owners and tenants, and it was changed to remove tenants. So I, I know it's in there as it is now. So I was just looking at this last night, so let me just bring up the, the current. I was looking at the old one. So I'm getting the 160D confused. Yes, yes, so the 160D was the one that had the previous language. So this one does say the tenants, yes, correct. Right, the tenants is broader than, go back one, go back to the slide. Yes. Nope. Go back to where you just were. Right here. Nope. Nope. I think it was the very bottom of this one. One more. <laughs> this no. one. Yeah. This would include occupants of single family. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So we'll change, we would change Adopted that language of the UDO is broader than that. This, yes. as written, seems to suggest the intent was only to include those, and that was not the intent. Right. So it. We'll correct, we'll, we'll correct this slide. And I have a, also, I do have a little, this goes into our agenda discussion later, this presentation was not included in our packet either. I just put this together last I, night. I understand. <laughs> we'll have the discussion later, mm -hmm. but what we're getting presented with, we should be able to prepare for. Mm -hmm. And there's other inconsistencies already in this that are giving me concern. On the previous slide, you said there's no consensus but then you mentioned there was actual discussion of a quarter mile and there was active conversation. And at some point the committee landed on the thousand. No, was there unanimity? No, but consensus is different than unanimity. 
Right. So, so I'm, my, 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 if I may explain, my, my take there is, is that when I approached, because the thousand feet came from a direct suggestion from staff to the consultant. That's where that came from, because I have the actual edit that went to them. Um, so when I'm saying that there was not a consensus, that was the consultant's feeling coming out of those meetings. There was a consensus on all the, you know, the range of things that were discussed, but the folks who were on the one side, what we were hearing from them was not, there, 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 there was no, no final on what it should or shouldn't be. They did acknowledge that, you know, to some degree, that notifying non-property owners was probably a good thing, but I think there was still disagreement based on whether folks were renting a single family home, potentially being in a longer term situation versus those living in traditional apartments. And that was just our, that was our perception of the discussion that took place. And I just, I, again, we will let you continue. Uh, just yeah. that what we're, we had, there was something that was adopted. Yes. And yes. it was adopted for a myriad of reasons and analysis and recommendation. I mean, if you made the recommendation for a thousand feet, you probably had some rationale for that. Sure. Um, so I, I just want to be clear that we have something that's adopted and there's commentary yes. in the margins that isn't part of the UDO, particularly yes. related to HOAs. Yeah. So we have a policy and now we're going to change elements of it and we can get into the why the policy got to the way it is or we can say this is what the policy is this is the change we want and this is why we want the change so i just wanted that all to be clear because there's some ambiguity that's being injected into it that i think muddies the kind of very simple question we ultimately have to answer right so i'm sorry continue no, that's okay no, I'm glad, I'm glad you caught that, because admittedly, we're still juggling the three versions of the ordinance, so it's, it, it, it happens. Um, so the Planning Commission discussion, this again is what I interpreted from what staff um, told me, and we went back and re-listened to it to make sure that we were getting the correct, um, what folks went on record as saying. Um, they primarily focused their discussion on the distance, and discussed occupants of single-family dwelling units and occupants of multifamily dwelling units. Um, the majority recommendation, again, not unanimous, um, but the majority recommendation from Planning Commission was to go with 1,000 feet, um, and yes to notify and continuing to notify occupants of single-family dwelling units. Um, but again, that was like a, f I think, I don't wanna say anything wrong. One of these was a 4-3. Um, thousand feet was five two. The multifamily was three four three. Yeah, we had for the occupants four um, stated their preference for option A, um, which was to keep notifying just single fam or or to change to notifying just single family dwelling unit occupants. One did not uh, state a preference, and two preferred B, which was to continue. Um, both single family and multifamily. So, where staff is at, um, again, you know, we we endorse the the original UDO um, distance. Again, I think anything we think anything up to a quarter mile walking distance is reasonable. If you're within walking distance, you're probably more impacted than somebody who's not within walking distance. That seems to be a logical uh, kind of break point, and a thousand feet is not far from that. Um, there's no practical objections to occupants of single family dwelling units, and I'm going to just switch over to this is where I wanted to bring up the IMAP system and how some of the GIS information is, is loaded and and maintained at the county where we pull the addressing information from. Um, this is a section of the Aberly Apartments. Uh, you can see here the owner. Um, they have a mailing address. That mailing address is not here in Garner. Um, so 
if we were just notifying property owners only, that address in Blacksburg, Virginia would be the only address receiving a notice, a mail notice. The site address is this one up here. So the parcel's primary address, site address, is this 300 Aberley Crest Boulevard. Um, most any county GIS system across the state is always going to have that. Um, so that's why you see some communities, and us now included, uh, being very readily able to mail a notice to the site address. And it's easy to determine when it's different. Um, there's actually a quick little query that we can run that finds duplicates, so if they match, uh, we can eliminate the duplicates and that way we're not wasting resources. What is new and what has given staff a little bit of heartburn um, regarding the multifamily structures is that this was a lay the addressing layer, um, as I said before, has been the subject of a county project for a number of years. Um, their first primary reason for getting better address data was for E911. Um, and for the most part, that addressing data lived in a different system that only the emergency operators had access to. Um, and there wasn't a whole lot of trying to bring that data back over into more public uh, facing realms. But if you look here in this box in the lower right hand corner, you'll now see a whole list of addresses. And I think you will remember I mentioned that there's more than just dwelling units that get addresses. The trash compactor will get an address. Um, the shelter, the clubhouse, <clears throat> everything gets an address these days. Um, because if there's something that can catch fire or somebody needs to respond to, they want to be able to pinpoint it as close as possible. So for a while, we had access to that list, but we had no way of being able to filter it because they were just loading the addresses in. And yes, you could potentially display them on a map, but again, you would have to go and try and manually figure out which ones were actually pointing to dwelling units and which ones were not. What they have now done is anything that actually is a dwelling unit, they have coded and it now appears under this, and it probably doesn't, on one hand, make much sense, but they call it residential structure. Um, but that allows us to differentiate the dwelling units from every other address on the site. So you'll see here, this one says multifamily structure, that's for the whole building. Uh, but then each one of these, and you'll see the cursor, well, these are actually all on top of each other. Um, so you won't see the cursor move, but you can see it moves slightly between the building address and the individual units. Um, and then, like I say, so staff feels better about that now that we have that resource more readily available to us and in a way that we can, again, get rid of the addresses that aren't actually mailable um, and therefore expending resources on paper printing and mailing that would not be um, be otherwise used. So that being said, um, I, I will just say, you know, that we as staff are comfortable in being able to continue the way the ordinance is written today. Um, we are open to whatever the council's direction um, is on this matter. Um, I did just include some points to ponder, um, which I won't go into a whole lot. Um, but again, we do have the two required neighborhood meetings that come earlier in the process. Again, trying to get folks engaged earlier. Um, so there are now, under the new ordinance, three mailings um, to those potential same folks. Um, for each rezoning project um, under the new ordinance as well, if there's going to be a subsequent special use permit, there could be another round of three mailings. Um, the town employee effort, um, again, that's where I've really been trying to focus on being able to, the ease of generating the list, not so much the length of the list, um, but the length, you know, we do still have to stuff the envelopes, uh, even if we have the applicant 
print and provide us with the envelopes. We still have to, you know, do the stuffing and the actual mailing. Um, these requirements, again, I don't want anybody to forget, these equally apply to large corporate projects as well as smaller projects like somebody's individual residential setback variance. Um, and again, uh, you know, having been in this field for 25 years, I just don't, don't ever want to get to the point of where, you know, we're raising red flags that we don't want to be raising because um, we've seen the pendulum swing back and forth and things have been taken away um, from residents. Uh, and then just to acknowledge some of the, the comments that have been made too, that you know there is some merit to the argument that a wider notice area can dilute the voice of those more closely impacted, but there's also equal merit to, our, to the argument of hearing more voices. Um, you know, in the past, the planning process focused more on getting those voices involved in the long-range planning efforts um, so that the vision was clearly laid out. Um, but things change, and we try to adapt to it. So again, uh, the big takeaway that I would like to just give you from staff is that we're open to keeping it how it is or to changing it um, however you all would like to proceed. Okay, and with that said, let me uh, offer up to other council members an opportunity to weigh in on the subject. I know Mr. Dellinger had a number of comments and questions, but um, um, let me see if others uh, have uh, thoughts on this. I'll start with Mr. Singleton. Well, one thing I think that we've realized that uh, the burden of time and effort uh, addressing all the envelopes, uh, getting postage on the envelopes, because uh, I think what Jeff has noted that postage metering is not acceptable, it needs to fall on the burden of who's, who is presenting the plan, the developer of the project. I have no problem with that at all. At all. Uh, what you've told us here is, and let me clarify, make sure I'm, some of the, some of the multifamilies have individual addresses and some of them don't. And when the GIS system that Wake County has for these layers, you said, some can do that, but some you're basically prevented from doing that because you don't have an individual address. Is that what I understood to say? So our assumption is, and I can't, unfortunately, I can't vouch for this, and I haven't been able to get up with somebody in the GIS department over there who can. Of the parcels, the multifamily parcels we've checked, um, it appears all the address information is in there. What I don't know for sure, I would hope that they would not have published this on their public map service without it being complete. But what I don't know for sure is that it, that process has been completed for every multifamily project in Garner. So I would just want to have the, you know, the caveat, this is a public database that's the most current available. Um, but we have checked multifamilies of different sizes and it would appear that it's complete, but I can't say with 100% certainty that it is. Uh, so I, I have, I think that's, <clears throat> if, if we can get the notification to each individual unit in the multifamily, that's fine. If that information is there, again, the burden of that and getting that information to us will fall on the applicant uh, in the process. And basically, they have to bring it to you and the staff will mail it so that way you know it got mailed. They can't say, well, we, we mailed it when they may not have mailed it. So that's why, that's why staff has to do the mailing. That's yeah. required. Okay. Um, also, I know we've talked about the, the distance, so forth and so on. And Mr. Dellinger, excuse me. Yeah, Mr. Dellinger, uh, we had a couple of discussions about, hey, and I'm sure he'll present this. He may or may not, but talked about an average in the county of actually being more, not 1,000 feet, but more around 800 feet. Um, and I, he may address that, so I'll let him address that. So I'm, I'm open to that uh, also. I'll soften down there. Okay. Um, I'll get back to Mr. Dillinger a minute. Mr. Matthews, any comments you want to share? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, I know we've had a good, hearty discussion about this in past meetings, and uh, I thought we had pretty much agreed pretty much agreed to, that the 500 we're moving out from the 300 that we're at now increase it up to 500 and I thought the majority of as we talked agreed to that 500 figure 
We're at a thousand now. We're not at three hundred. Yeah, we were. Right? I, I know that. I'm just saying. I just be, but to be clear, we're not going from three hundred to five hundred. What I'm we're, saying we're is, at well, thousand. we were at three hundred. But we're not okay. Now. We were at three hundred. Yes, it jumped up to a thousand. But if we come to that five hundred feet from where we were at at three hundred, that would be an increase. Yeah. And I thought we pretty much agreed on that 500 figure. And again, I'm, I'm not going to engage until council's had an opportunity to uh, to discuss this more fully. But it's, I can't find it right now on my agenda. But somewhere in the packet is a uh, is a chart showing what uh, municipalities throughout uh, Wake County have on this. And and I thought what the council was doing was uh, previously was getting pretty much closer to what seemed to be the average by most municipalities. Would the council agree I've, on that? No, I've evidence, uh, I've evidence to the contrary when it's my turn. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? No, sir, I just, we, that 500 was the figure we were working <laughs> okay. with and All right. that's, that's what we had to work with at the time. And uh, uh, I think that's a, a, a good figure and uh, we, should, we should maintain that. Okay, all right. Ms. Barron. It's a couple of things. What is the average in the county, uh, the average distance for notification? Uh, information. There's a chart on page so 112. I, I have just a different for, chart. Yeah, yeah, I was just because referencing that it's in there. But yeah. it, I have issues with the chart, but I'll, get, I'll okay. wait my turn. Yeah. Yes. I'm just making sure so they can see it. So at some point, do we, we have to it. decide which chart is accurate and which one is not? But That's accurate. <laughs> I'm just all right well let me let me hear from Mr. Vance for I have one more thing oh, okay. to say. Me, go ahead. Uh, I was on the UDO rewrite committee and I truly do not remember us voting on a thousand feet I remember discussing it but I do not remember us voting on it I may have missed it a lot of those meetings were remote but I did attend every one of them either remotely or in person um, so I have some concerns about that because I do not remember us voting on a thousand feet. Okay. Mr. Vance, anything? Uh, can you pull up the the, the charts, the chart with the the various distances on it? Okay. And this is the verified verified chart, verified numbers of to your knowledge. So everyone that has a V on it, I, we talked to somebody in their planning department. Well, you've verified Is everybody that. except Zebulon, right? I'm sorry. Um, Fuquay, Verena, Zebulon, and Johnston County. Okay. I'm sorry, go ahead, Mr. Vance. Now going back to what you mentioned in reference, I, I heard a, I hate to get down to the nitty gritty of it, but I heard, I heard a quarter of a mile, but yet we're looking at a Looking at currently considering a thousand feet, a quarter of a mile is roughly 1,300 plus feet. So that's more than a thousand feet. Yes. But you're actually saying a thousand feet now, based upon the analysis that you've done and looked at going through, looking at the mailing lists and, and uh, the multifamily uh, situation and I guess, I guess the GIS data where there is a level of comfort with that. So at the time, not having a definitive recommendation, but needing to put something in there for the hearing and for review. Um, it was staff's opinion to go with the thousand. It was not, you know, the max of a quarter mile, so we weren't going all the way out there. And a thousand was the maximum at the time that anybody was doing. Um, Wake County still does that. Raleigh has some provisions in it where their neighborhood meetings may still have that, but for their public hearings, it's not. Um, so this was specifically for public hearings of a legislative um, type rezoning, which is gonna be the most common type of case that you would have. Gotcha. And, just to, and just, I may veer off a little here, but in reference to the other means of notif notifying the public or the public being aware of of uh, of the various various public hearings, we do have a method of doing that. So there's a subscription service and the publication on the town's website, and folks can subscribe to that. So anytime something goes out, they can get notified that way. And then the signs are another visual, you know, cue awareness raiser as well. 
Okay, so it's not like we are trying to hide information from folks or not <coughs> so they cannot be notified. It's, there, are, there are means in which the public is notified them, uh, clearly about when a public hearing is happening, so it's clearly there uh, for them to do it. Yeah. I understand. And in, one, one last question in reference to the multifamily homes. Uh, understand that uh, you, you will have the address, but do we have an idea of the accuracy of those addresses, knowing that typically, well, many instances, they are uh, transient in nature? nature? Sure. So, so, again, the address list is maintained by the county, and its original purpose was for E911 purposes. So if there's anything that's going to be as accurate as it can be, that should be the database that's accurate because if it's not emergency response is going to the wrong location it's the best the best data we have available publicly and free okay yeah mr Dellinger, your turn yeah. um i i just want to speak in support of the policy we have um it's on the books it was vetted it's consistent with our comprehensive plan. There are elements of the, any adjustment that actually aren't consistent with regards to renters. It does promote community engagement. It's inclusive and non-discriminatory. Um, I had some concerns in, in seeing the petition, some of the comments from residents concerned about transparency and reducing the transparency that is there. Um, and I have this talking about the chart. I'll hand it to council. So I did an analysis, if you would hand. Um, so when we look at the, the chart, Thanks, sir. and you have all the municipalities on it, this map, if you look at this map, so you made the distinction, Raleigh does have a notification area of 1,000 feet for uh, neighborhood meetings. We don't make that distinction in our UDO. This is the same notification policy. So Raleigh is at 1,000 feet for neighborhood meetings, of which there would be two. Wake County is also at 1,000 feet, and Cary is at 800. So the map you're looking at, if it's in dark black, it's got a notification area under 800 feet. That means the rest of the county, Raleigh, Cary, Garner, unincorporated parts of Wake County are at 800 or 1,000 feet. And if you flip over, that's 80, with Garner, that's 85% of the county is at that higher notification threshold. That means our current UDO is consistent with the majority of the land mass in the county. The other chart is by population. So if you take into account all of those municipalities, Raleigh, Cary, unincorporated, Wake County, which a lot of our area is near unincorporated areas, so they already have 1,000 feet, 76% of the county is consistent. We're consistent now with 76% of the county. So what smaller areas are doing doesn't necessarily make it consistent. So the 1,000 feet is actually very consistent with what is being practiced throughout much of the county. I'm supportive of that. I think it, it's, again, what was vetted, what was recommended by staff, and it's what we passed um, when we vet passed the UDO. I have, uh, it's a basic question. Who, who do we, how many people do we want to notify? Who do we want to notify? And who's going to pay for it? Those are the three issues on the table. The UDO as it is now, has defined how many people and the who is anybody. It doesn't matter if you're a renter or an owner. You live in Garner, you're a resident. We want your voice. That's what our current policy says. And I think that is a great place to be from a policy standpoint. Um, and I have a lot of other points, but I think I'm just in favor of, of keeping what we have if we want to uh, change the the fiscal responsibility or even split it i did some calculations on time and uh, cost and they're not significant um they're not they're nominal uh but i, I like 
what we have and if we want to, but if we want to change the fiscal burden i'm not opposed to it i'm also not opposed to keeping it and it being part of what we do is our community outreach requirement to engage our citizens um i'll pass to someone else if uh, anyone has anything else i've got some other points but um council if uh i think i indicated earlier that i would uh have a member of the public who signed up and wanted to speak on this issue, I believe. Can I ask a clarifying question? And maybe I'm the, I might be the only one confused about this, but if the county um, mapping database has the building addresses, how does each dwelling unit get a copy of the mailing or the notice? Because it could be 16 units in each apartment. It, but each one has its own unique address. Oh, each. So here, not just the building. So it has the A, B, whatever unit number they. Right. How so they in, in most unit? cases, it actually is a completely separate number. Um, so, but if it had a unit number, that would be included as well. So for this particular complex, 1014, 1015, 1016, those are all individual units. Yeah. One thousand is the building shell. Okay, got you. Okay. Yep. yep. Gotcha. Mr. Mayor, all right. can I get a point of clarification while Jeff is up here? That previous slide with all the communities verifying it, so, so you're telling us that those are the notification, that is accurate numbers as we sit here tonight with these municipalities? For the, for the public, for the zoning public here. Yes, okay. Yes. Okay, thank yes. you. Okay, I'm gonna recognize Ms. Cardenas for three minutes. Or do you need her address and stuff? Yeah. State yes. your name and, and address, please. Okay. Kathleen Cardenas, 1609 South Wade Avenue, Garner, North Carolina. So I'm trying to be quick and concise. Last time they said I talked too fast. The time before I spoke and it wasn't recorded. So hopefully I'm acknowledged as really speaking this time. Um, first of all, thank you for verifying the addresses because I had commented, I spoke to a retired uh, town planner from another municipality who even being retired knew that you could access that. So um, it is being used in other municipalities to reach all of the apartments. Um, number one, in all of the research I've done, there's live websites for most of the, well, I didn't look every single town. Every town that I looked at has live updates. Wake Forest is amazing. They have a monthly newsletter that they have posted that shows all of the developments, all of the rezoning, very comprehensive graphics, everything. So other towns might have a smaller notification area, but they have live updated re um, data. For the town of Garner, you were very good in sending me the information, but I just had breakfast with someone on Sunday who said, how could we find out when they're rezoning? And I said, let me give you an email. <laughs> but you have to email and make that request. So if anyone in the community wants to make that request, you're gonna be overwhelmed with emails as well as having to do mailings. Um, so that's number one. Um, number two, regarding the, it used to be 300, Actually, a lot of the land that we're talking about has just been incorporated. So it used to be county land. And that very piece of property, like if I'm standing here, it was county, and now all of a sudden it's Garner. So that piece of property really was 1,000 feet. And then by being incorporated, it lost that privilege of notification. So we have to be careful when we're saying it was 300, because it really was 1,000. Um, the other thing regarding people being transient, which I really don't like that term, but people being transient, the address is never sent to Mr. Smith or Mr. Garcia. The address is sent to resident at a specific address. So unless a building burns down, there would still be the resident living there. So it's not specific to a person, it's to a location. Um, and putting the, the development, the burden on instead of developers on HOAs, I'm the secretary for our HOA, um, where I have a rental property, and we are always trying to keep costs down. It gets very expensive. So if we had to foot the bill for the developers every time they decided to send out a notification, 
that's not fair to us because we're not doing the developing. That's on a developer that shouldn't be on a resident that comes out of our annual fee when it gets put on the HOA. Um, and then regarding renters, I have two quotes from the um, UDO, which I happened to save onto my computer because now with Clue, the old UDO that we've been using disappeared off of the website. Um, the old UDO on page 35 of the Garner Forward UDO document, Land Use, says the overarching framework of the Garner Forward Comprehensive Plan is the development and continuing refinement of a land use map and set of strategies that capitalize and support the kinds of use uses that the community wishes to see. Land use is therefore not a separate topic, but instead sets the table for all the other topics, including housing, character of place, transportation, and new development actions. So the community needs to be involved if the community is the one who is supposed to be benefiting. And second, under guiding principles on page 29, it says a big reason that so much care and effort were dedicated to working with the public and team members was that the input from all of these efforts would lead to the overarching goals and objectives. So I feel that the UDO clearly states that the public, the community, people that are living in this area count and I think we need to respect having more voice. And I am greatly appreciative that you all listened to my many emails. And even if you didn't document that I spoke, you are acknowledging my existence now, so thank you. All right, thank you, ma'am, and I appreciate your uh, trying to stay within the uh, time limit there. And I can almost uh, assuredly say to you that your comments uh, were recorded tonight and will be there in perpetuity, I guess, probably. Thank you very much uh, for taking time to come out. Okay, uh, Council, where are we? Uh, Mr. Dellinger was, uh, has, has supplied information in regards to the point he was making there. Um, ultimately, um, I guess the action is to consider information, confirm or amend the direction of the, of the, uh, of the request here. So uh, is anybody prepared yet to say, based on this discussion, that um, you're ready to bring forth uh, a, a motion regarding what council expects uh, would be the proper um, policy on this matter? Again, just to review, uh, Mr. Treesenberg, can you come back and uh, I'm, I'm not going to try to review it. We, we cur currently we have the is it is it the 1,000 feet for notification? 1,000 feet and all tenants occupants. Okay, all right. And your department does does the stuffing of the envelopes and so forth. Um, the developer pays for the postage, so is that right or they not? They don't yet. Oh, okay. Um, but that would be, that was kind of part of the proposal that we've been discussing. That would have to come as a, a um, probably need to consult and get the town attorney's opinion whether that could just be a fee schedule change. Um, the intent was as long as we were amending to go ahead and throw some language in the UDO to that effect. Mm -hmm. But I th think, I feel like some communities have just done it as a matter of practice by amending their fee schedule. Um, so if that's part of it, let's just say we want to keep the UDO as it is um, and do the thousand feet and all of the occupants of the buildings, but we do want to go ahead and shift some of that burden with the postage and the printing of the envelopes. Um, if we can do that with just a fee schedule amendment, we could just declare this package dead and then focus on doing a fee schedule amendment. Or we could keep this um, UDO amendment alive and just restrict it to um, the part that speaks about shifting that cost. Mm -hmm. Do you want to make Did a that comment make sense, on that, Ms. Jones? I'll have to look into that because part of the UDO is there is something about if it's a subdivision fee, you have to provide notice and a hearing on that. So even if it is part of the fee schedule, we might still have to come back with public notice and a hearing. 
and normally the fee schedule would be adopted with the budget each year, but it can be amended at any time. Mm -hmm. So maybe to be safe, we should, if we want to keep that in, which I think we do, um, just reduce, and if it's, the, if it's, <laughs> if you want to keep things as they are, but change that part, then we'll just tailor this down for your final approval. It would have to come back to council. Any change from what's in the existing UDO would have to come back for final action at a regular meeting. Okay. And without sounding petty, I, I would just make a footnote. I believe the price of a first class stamp just went up to 60 cents. Is that right? It, am I the only one who heard that? 63. <laughs> it, it's up there. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's kind of neither here nor there. Mr. Matthews. Yeah, well, Mr. Mayor, uh, relevant to what we're talking about here, if we, this might be an attorney question, but can we vote on a specific part of this UDO, i.e., if we just want, if I wanted to make a motion on the distance based upon what I see here and vote on that item individually, then everything else could be individual. It don't have to be in total. We could vote on just a portion of it like the distance. Yes, you can certainly bifurcate a motion and it's probably clear if everyone knows what you have consensus on. Okay. Are you sensing there's consensus on, on the footage distance? On the footage, yes, that's what I'm talking about, yes. I'm thinking there is too. And uh, based upon the notification area, everywhere I've seen here, uh, carry is 800. The next under it's been 500, 500, 500 is a 300, and a couple of two or three, 200 feet. So Raleigh, Raleigh is a thousand feet for neighborhood meetings, which is what would be included if we change the UDO from our current thousand. So Raleigh is at a thousand. We don't make a distinction between our public hearings and our neighborhood meeting notifications. So for our broader purposes of notification, if we're wanting to be inclusive, you need to read Raleigh as a thousand feet. But it says 500 here. Yeah, that's, I'll, I'll say it again. It, 500 is for zoning, but they have a different provision for neighborhood meetings that is 1,000 feet. Our UDO as written is 1,000 feet for neighborhood meetings and rezonings. So it's really, if you want to read it as 500 slash 1,000, that might be appropriate, but they're not at 500. The 500 would change our ex execution and inclusion very significantly. It would cut it in half, basically. Yes, sir. So I believe I heard Jeff say the, uh, did, I don't want to put words in his mouth. Did you say the thousand feet is, uh, is reasonable in your mind? Well, I don't know if that's the right term. Well, I mean, we staff recommended that go in, so at, it should still be reasonable. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I mean, that to me is a is is, a, is I guess a point we should move forward with from there. Um, is it see. appropriate to make a motion on the 500 feet of, and see how the vote goes? Well, I, I mean, if if you want to make that motion, I, I wouldn't rule it out of order, but uh, I I think it would be preferable to 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 in my mind. To um, to go with the thousand feet, but I'm not voting, so I again. I might get shot down, but I'm prepared to make that motion, Mr. Mayor. If that's in line. So let me hear from to Mr. give Mayor. direction. This still would need to be put on a regular meeting agenda, and depending on what the outcome is, we may need to do additional notice to be able to make an ordinance amendment. But we could vote on now on the, if we want to change that to 500. It would be helpful to give guidance, but it's it's my opinion that this is not ripe tonight for a vote. This okay. was to give direction to staff. Well, I'd like ever have we want to do that, uh, have that where we can do a vote on 500 feet versus 1,000, whatever would be appropriate. Um. 
I think my answer to that is yes. I'm still trying to think that through. So, uh, I, I let, guess. Let me go. The public hearing you had originally, I believe, was for 500 yes. feet. Yes. When it went to Planning Commission, there were some options. Yes. For, for purposes of tonight, if it makes it easier, I can just ask do you know do you favor and you can give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down if that works just throw that I support out staff's recommendation so if keeping keeping it at a thousand feet thumbs up the distance at a thousand feet or we don't want to do thumbs we go down to 800 feet because of we what need to, other <laughs> we got to decide whether we're doing. scheduling a public hearing or not <clears throat> So, what did you say? So I could uh, live with 800 feet. Okay. Uh, that's what Carrie is practicing, even though their LDO says it's 100 feet. I think it's been stated by both staff and Mr. Dellinger that, that despite having it in their LDO, they do 800 feet. So I'm wondering why they don't put 800 feet in there, but that's their business, not ours. Now, I think, well, I, I mean, there's other things that have been discussed too about the property location, the the information i mean the red that we have here that all those need to be discussed i think all of us agree that applicants should be responsible for providing the information i think everyone agrees with that i don't think anyone's going to disagree with that so do we agree with the other parts of it too there's a part one with the distance and then there's a part two about property occupants part a and part b that we also need to either thumb up or thumb down the other issue with the distance is some of the municipalities require notif notif notifying hoas and i was does not it's just addresses and to her point when if you even if you notify the HOA do they have the capacity to send that notice out so there's the notification area but what's missing from the chart I know that Wake Forest Fuquay and I think I made notes somewhere at least I think apex and maybe one other they require if it touches a neighborhood that has an HOA that that HOA needs to be notified which is again sort of additionally cumbersome ours is actually cleaner than that but that's another thing to keep in mind even with a small notification area if it touches up against a neighborhood those folks are there's a, a mechanism for trying to reach out to even more people so we're not even doing that with a, an 800 or a thousand feet we're keeping it simple more simple for staff than adding an HOA layer on top of it so if there is consensus on Mr. Singleton's uh, suggestion, recommendation of 800 feet, then we wouldn't take a formal vote tonight, Ms. Jones, would we? And, and that would come. Uh, I didn't know there was consensus on 800 feet yet. We had. We had, I don't think we just well, well, Mr. I'm saying if, the, if there is. Mr. Yeah. Matthew said 500. That's yeah. three different people, three by three I know, people. I know, I know, I <laughs> know. But uh, we. I wouldn't. I don't know if I'd take odds on any of them. Well, maybe not. <laughs> you need to ask Mr. Vance and Ms. Banger how they feel, and they yeah. might answer one of them. If they both feel on 500, then that answers the question. If they both feel on 1,000, that answers the question. I prefer 500. All right. Ms. Banger is on record of saying uh, 500. Mr. Vance, you care to weigh in? Uh, I'm willing to compromise of 800. Okay. Mr. Matthews? Five. We got five. We got five. We got five. Do we have eight? Do we have eight? Do we have eight? <laughs> Sorry, I'm scared. <laughs> we 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 really need to come to some some agreement. But if I was understanding Miss Jones correctly, um, this matter would come back before us after tonight's meeting. Uh, I assume for, on, on a recommendation from 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 Jeff from planning. Is that your understanding, Mr. Treasonberg? But we have to give them a distance to come back with. Yeah. If it'll create a consensus, I uh, will go to 800. There's three 800s. Your three 800s, okay. Is there a thumbs up on the 800? If there are, let me see those. Three of us just said 800. Okay. All right. All right. And the other other council members uh, prefer 500. Prefer, but. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well. I, then, then, then I would clear the uh, majority uh, favors uh, the 800 uh, foot distance, and that would be your direction from this council. Um, and then, what will you bring back to us, Jeff, or when? 
we will, I will get it drafted up and let uh, John and Terry take a look at it and um, as soon as scheduling allows. Okay. So I'm assuming then that we're all in agreement upon the, the property, excuse me, the property occupant information that Jeff uh, told to us about uh, individual complexes and it can go to the address and also the, the uh, responsibility from the, uh, for the applicant to provide the information. So I'm assuming we're all in agreement on that. Okay. Yeah. I don't think I heard any disagreement that, on that. That manifests itself in, in not changing the language that's there. Okay. Except to change the word from tenant to occupant. Okay. Right. But the cost shifting is a new change. Yes. So, so the actual change to the UDO would be the distance. Word. And cost the burden. cost shifting. And, and, in, and the tenant versus occupant. Right. That's you. Okay. I, I'm. I'm just going to summarize by saying for the members of the public or whoever, I, I really believe in my heart and I and believe it's, it's based on comments here that this council wants to do what is good and reasonable. Nobody's trying to hide anything from the public and um, make this uh, uh, clandestine kind of operation. We, we're wanting to do what we can that is reasonable, consistent with probably what uh, others are doing and something that makes us aware of the cost. We're not looking to go way beyond but uh, at any rate that's my sense and so uh, I believe unless anybody has anything else on this matter uh, we'll declare this uh, Can resolved. I just Excuse add me. one thing it won't be ready to come back for February 6th no. there is an issue with permit choice which means any amendment you make to the UDO applicants can choose whether they want the old version or the new version so these changes might still not be implemented for quite some time because you would need because they might not want to do it because if it's an added burden on them and, and right. so i just want you to be aware that um, there's some debate in the legal community as to whether permit choice applies to this type of regulation but because it's in the udo the consensus seems to be that applicants can choose that and in some cases might be able to choose i don't want you know, I want 800 feet. Well, probably they wouldn't, but I don't want to pay for the mailing. Mm -hmm. And so, so there could be, so it may be a little bit of time before this could be fully implemented. Right. And I hear you saying, I believe that, you know, to use the term, it can't be made retroactive. It's well, a, a the applicant term. always gets the choice. Right. <laughs> and sometimes Sometimes changes are favorable to applicants and sometimes they may not perceive them as favorable. So just so that the public's aware that this, this might not get, whatever we do, it doesn't al it can't always be fully implemented when it's a, a UDO change. Right. Okay. All right. If council's clear on that, then all right. I believe we have exhausted this matter for now. Thank you, Jeff, for Thank your, you. uh, uh, for your patience there with us all. Okay, um, Ms. Leah, I think you're next on the, uh, at the podium there. She's gonna lead us in a discussion of traffic calming. So I recognize you, our town attorney. Engineer. Excuse me, town <laughs> engineer. I've gotten so many new titles lately. I'm not John trying to, manager, I'm not trying to change your title, I'm sorry. You've got quite the, quite the promotion here recently. I know, I knew I was busy, but I think I should have been even more busy. <laughs> All right. Okay, hold on. I've got a council member that then reminds me that we haven't uh, taken a, a reasonable break in time. So uh, if you'll hold on for a little bit. Yeah, let's take a 10 minute break. I was wondering why, why she didn't say something before because it's okay. past two hours. Have good manners. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, uh, I'll declare a 10 minute recess and we'll come back and I believe we can wrap up our business uh, hopefully fairly shortly. Okay.
We'll please come to order and the council will be back in session. And we will uh, take up now item number three, traffic calming Main Street and Pool Drive. And our presenter is our town engineer, not our town attorney, Miss um, uh, Leah Harrison. Thank yes. you. Thank you all. Good evening. Um, so I just wanted to talk with y'all tonight about traffic calming along Main Street and Pool Drive. These are two streets within the town of Garner that are a little bit unique, and I know we've kind of talked about this with, with you before. Um, we do have the traffic calming program, which I know you all are aware of, that really is applicable to residential streets, which is where traffic calming is primarily done. Of course, we're not putting you know speed tables on a major thoroughfare or something similar. Um, these two streets are similar in that they are smaller, lower speed streets. There are residences that immediately front on them, but they also contain a mixture of commercial properties and public properties. Um, so they don't quite fit within the traffic calming program, but they are potential candidates for traffic calming due to some of the concerns. So we just wanted to look at um, some options for those streets that we have. So Main Street first, just a kind of rundown summary of where we stand with that. There is overall a desire for traffic calming within the main downtown corridor along Main Street. I think especially as that area attracts a lot more walkable business and there's a lot more people out and about, we certainly don't want it to be an unsafe place to be. Um, the kind of the, the timing catch that we're in here, a couple of things. So. Um, Typically, you know, we install speed tables as one of the options which we're looking at here tonight. Those are asphalt. Um, they can be done along with our resurfacing contract we do a lot of times. Um, when you do resurface the street, they're typically milled off and removed and then replaced because you can't really mill around the asphalt speed tables. Um, so Main Street is actually due to be resurfaced within the next couple of years based on the pavement condition. Um, However, there's also a lot of other things going on in downtown, which I'm sure you are well aware of. Uh, we have construction of the public-private um, kind of development project by the, the rec center that will be happening within the next year or so. Um, we have a streetscape project at the corner of Rand Mill and Main Street that will be happening. There are townhomes going up sometime soon they're they're starting work out there um, so what we don't want to happen is to go resurface all of main street and have it torn to pieces by construction traffic so our recommendation would be to wait to resurface until the bulk of that heavy construction is done and then we resurface the entire street so that we're left with a clean slate that's not um, damaged immediately um, the speed tables can be installed in the interim and we'll look at some figures which will make this make a little bit more sense. Um, but I have looked at some options for kind of a more long-term approach as well, which is similar, but just a little enhanced. So getting here, this is more of a potential future solution, um, which you will see is similar to the immediate solution, um, but more built out. So for one piece, um, you can see, where's my... On your upper right corner, um, this is a clip from the, the plans that we have for the project, streetscape project at Rand Mill and Main Street. So part of that project will be to do some curb extensions around that intersection and then also a stamped asphalt treatment in the intersection. Um, so that is something that will be done with that project, but it will provide traffic calming as well. Those are traffic calming measures. Um, the potential speed table locations you'll see identified kind of on both ends of the main street, the main corridor here. Um, these eventually in the future after we resurface this entire street, I think these could also serve a dual purpose as something like a raised crosswalk to provide a pedestrian crossing, which you can see examples of on the bottom left um, of different ways that those could be treated but being that it is this downtown area and we're promoting the walkability and to have a cohesive look we could mirror the stamped asphalt that will happen at rand mill and do a basically a speed table that also acts as a raised crosswalk or something similar with stamped asphalt as well so this is just looking at kind of long-term solution 
in the short term until we get the resurfacing done and all of the construction done, we would propose just installation of standard asphalt speed tables in those same locations. So that would be basically one near the intersection with Montague Street. It's hard to tell precisely the location, but it's kind of sandwiched in between a catch basin there and the intersection and, and all, any other obstacles. And then similarly, one just east of uh, Griffin Street in a similar location. If we want to move forward with this, uh, I would propose adding it to our resurfacing contract for this year. That's how we have handled traffic calming um, in the past at different times because our resurfacing contractor can do the asphalt work. So this is a cost estimate for those speed humps. This is based on the prices that we had in the 2022 resurfacing contract for the traffic calming that was done in that contract. So this basically includes installation of the speed tables along with the striping that's required, the warning signs that are required about the speed humps coming up, and then the appropriate traffic control. And the total estimate for that is $12,400. Moving to Pool Drive, um, different street, oh, sure. Okay. It'd be appropriate if we talk about each one separately. I think it'd be. Uh, yeah, if council would prefer to do that, yeah, we, we could do that. Um, so maybe Go we'll just stop here. at this point, see if you have questions for Leah or, or discussion uh, regarding what she is proposing. Um, yeah, I'll start here with uh, Mr. Dellinger. Kathy probably has something to say too. We had our retreat. Um, I know you probably have something to say too. Um, we just did our DGA retreat and, you know, the safety of Main Street was a concern of the board members, but also the businesses um, that are there. And, and so what's the two things? What's the timeline for it, this immediate mm -hmm. on this? And then the other question is, is there any way to get any sort of at that Rand Mill, any type of center signage or, or something else midway? I know it's not conducive, I think, because of drainage and stuff for another speed table, but mm -hmm. something else even in between that would say, slow down or, or something like that or the kind of interim solution at yeah. this point yeah um, so as far as timeline we'll be putting out our resurfacing contract um, to bid probably in the next couple of weeks um, we usually do that at the beginning of the year so once we have direction on this then I'll finish packaging that up to go out so that would happen in the next six months or so um, under that contract they move pretty quickly once that's awarded and I think we could certainly look at doing something interim. I can take another look and see if there's any other location to put in another speed hump, but if not, um, we can look at, at if there are any other options to, to break that up. I know in the long term we'll have something there that acts as traffic calming, but right now there's there's nothing, so. Just, you know, thanks for getting on this, because I know Shayla, our downtown development manager's nearly been hit a couple times, and I know there are lots of others, so we're, the sooner the better, so thank you. Sure. Somebody's mm -hmm. been hit a couple of times? Been, nearly. Nearly. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> nearly. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Here's a different one. Yeah. Thank you. And Sorry. there was one occasion not too long ago where a two-year-old was walking in the middle of Main Street unattended. Oh, that's uh, probably I think that only happened maybe once or twice, but it's scary. Mm -hmm. uh, Main Street is about a block long, I mean, excuse me, about a mile long just enough for uh, a reckless driver to have a great time. And so we really appreciate this, Leah, because we, we've needed it and talked about it for so many years. Yeah. And it's just so ne necessary. Let me ask you two questions. Sure. Uh, the third item you listed under the, the uh, proposal <coughs> was traffic control. What does that mm -hmm. entail? Um, it's just the traffic control during construction. So all of the required signage and notification for them to be able to close a lane to put asphalt down as needed. And then one more question. Uh, you showed the picture of the bulb outs of the curb and, and, and curb and gutter. Mm -hmm. What will be between the edge of the front edge of the bulb outs and the existing curb? Just sidewalk. Yes. So I think some of that is still in development, but the idea is to have kind of a wider sidewalk area. Um, I think they're looking at potentially putting some planters and possibly some seating in that area as part of the Public street art? sake project. Maybe public art. Okay. I, I, All right. I would say that's a good option. But it's not yeah. just going to be concrete and that's it. Right. No, it, it will not be. I think the idea is to 
one, it provides traffic calming, but it also does provide us some space to, to make that a usable area as well. Yeah, could I, if I could add, Ms. Berenger, the original design of that, you may still see some renderings around, some color renderings if you see them. The original design there in that area had um, actually sort of a, a planting to help with absorption of the stormwater runoff. And we found that to not really be feasible with the existing storm drain system that is already under the street. So if you happen to see a drawing that's got a, a more dense planting in it, just know that that may have been the first version and we're looking at it again to figure out what would be more appropriate there. As long as it's just not solid concrete and nothing else. Thank you. Anything from you, Mr. Vance? Uh, well, I'll just say that in reference to the uh, proposed location for the speed tables on, on uh, Main Street, uh, I've, I've been uh, hearing the concerns of the council and, and a reference to what near misses have been happening and other things, plus with the increase of, fortunately, of traffic on East Garner Road, some some divert their their uh, transition over to Main Street, the traffic. So you have that play in there. And although it doesn't fall within the policy, this is one of those situations where we have to make those uh, those kind of decisions to right. do the best what's what's best for the citizens. Thanks, sir. Uh, Ms. Singlin, anything? A quick follow-up. The the uh, area at Randmill and Main Street, where we got the grant, I know that's a federal grant, and I know there's a lot of paperwork involved, a lot of hoops to drop to, to, to jump through. How, when do we think that project may possibly start and then the, the uh, estimated time for completion of that project? And, uh, I mean, I'm talking, I know I'm sure this is going to be a couple of three years. I'm just making an assumption knowing how long it's taken other federal projects. Yes, so some of that, I think the timing of the federal funding is not always certain. Um, but I would say as far as design, we should be wrapping up design, at least within this calendar year. Um, it may be sooner than that. Um, so I would look at construction ideally within the next two years. You said two years or three years? I said two years. Okay, okay. So hopefully it'll be completed within three years. Right. Okay, all right, just curious. Okay, thank you. Matthews. I think our timing is good on this. It's um, especially the development coming in across from the depot, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that in that entire area. It might be the new norm 10, 15 years from now, but it, that's going to be uh, uh, a very vibrant community as well as the new facility coming next to the rec center. And down there you've got the Zen Yoga place down in the lower level down there, and that's growing by leaps and bounds and connectivity up through there I, the, the timing is really good on this thing so uh, uh, quicker we do it the better good. okay <laughs> any other questions for Leah on the main street street coming mm -hmm. okay we'll move to the second project pool road <coughs> pool right. drive so you. pool drive is the second um, like we talked about it's kind of that similar unique combination of residential commercial and then the park at the end of the street so public property um, it is again a it's a long straight road um, so if you if you want to speed you have ample opportunity unfortunately um, so one note on the speed limit currently along pool drive the speed limit is 35 miles per hour near aversboro and then transitions to 25 miles per hour as you go back toward the park. Um, there is potential, and I would say probably even recommend it if we're going to look at installing speed tables to also reduce the speed limit along that entire stretch to 25. Uh, it just makes more sense if we're going to ask people to slow down for speed tables anyway to keep the speed low to begin with. Um, differently than Main Street, just as a note, Pool Drive is not scheduled to be resurfaced anytime soon. Um, it is in pretty decent condition compared to a lot of the other street ratings that we have. So if we are installing speed tables, they will not be immediately removed for resurfacing within the next few years. So this one is fairly straightforward other than you know the usual issues of avoiding driveways and catch basins and similar. Um, and I know this is not precise location because it's fairly zoomed out. But what we looked at was putting approximately five speed tables along Pool Drive um, on the east side, starting far enough back that you clear that intersection appropriately. Um, and any of the you know, immediate commercial properties that were there were not restricting access. 
and then space them as evenly as possible with appropriate locations to put them back to around the entrance of the park. Um, similar cost estimate, again, based on the traffic calming prices we had in last year's resurfacing contract. This one is a little higher just because we're proposing more of the speed tables, otherwise unit prices are the same. Um, this one came to $25,150, assuming the five speed tables that are shown in the sketch. And that is about all I had on Pool Drive. I will go back here if anyone has any questions on this one. Okay, and I'll just ask, the time frame for constructing those would be similar to what uh, you said would be for Main Street? Right, similar. I think if, you know, if we're ready to move forward with these, then putting them in this year's resurfacing contract will be the quickest way to get that done. Okay. Bill, anything? You're good. Mr. Sanger. Well, I, I texted or emailed uh, Mr. Hodges today. He said, yeah, we're talking to him. We talked about going and lowering the whole street to 25, which I think is logical. Um, <clears throat> so if, if we, if the council moves forward to do this, don't we need to send a letter to all these residents on Pool Drive and all the people who are off of it, uh, drum booing room and, and some of the bucket, brown bucket hand people who use that road, don't we need to send them a letter and let them know this is what's going to happen? So just popping it up out there. I mean, I know we don't have to do the notification because of get the, the, the petition from the neighborhood and, and so forth, but I think we ought to let them know that what's being talked about. I, I think we can do that. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's any specific requirement to, to notify in this case, but it would be best practice to do so. Um, well, to assign at the intersections? Since we're considering, and I think many people down there would appreciate it because of the issues of, you know, the, the, the speeding to and from the park, um, and the traffic that's involved sometimes on weekend activities down there with tournaments and so forth, whether it be softball or soccer or whatever, uh, or other sports. So I, I just, just something I would recommend is that we let some of these residents down here know that this is what the town is uh, considering doing. And um, you know, lowering the speed limit also, all the 25, and then also and show them this map where the uh, uh, proposals are to, in, to uh, put these uh, speed tables. So I just would ask that we do signage that. sufficient, or would council rather have mailings? What kind of signage you can do? Put them along the road every so often. I mean, what, kind of, what kind of, what kind of sure sign? We could though? explain it on a sign, though. So, that would be a challenge. Okay. Yeah. We could do a notification like, similar to what we do for a construction project, and then. Um, our resurfacing contractors typically do door hangers as well as they go through streets to resurface just to give everyone a heads up that there's going to be work happening on their street. So we could do something similar here I also. Want to let them know that this is what's being talked about because yeah. again, some of them have wanted it for a long time and there'll always be people who are opposed to it, but I think the majority of people, especially who live right along there, would appreciate it. So right, and just, they'll want to know why there's someone working on their street right. as well or if they're gonna have to close a lane, we would want them to okay, thank be you. warned. Ms. Parks, I know you live close to there, so uh, you get it firsthand here. Um, I'll let her speak for just a minute. I'm, I'm at Mona Parks, and I do live in, in, in this area that you guys are talking about. I live just off Pooh Drive, and I had a conversation with Ken and Rodney last summer about people speeding, because one of my neighbors was talking to me about it. And so, um, I think that most of them are going to be excited that we're going to get this because there is a little uh, muscle car that comes up and down Pooh Drive there. I mean, it wakes me up sometimes. It's so loud. And so I don't know why. It's just like a kid with a brand new toy. They just like the sound of the car. Or whether not, it's speeding. But if there's a muscle car that comes down up in there. People have been complaining about that little car. That uh, So we're glad to see that. There is what you call it calming. I'm glad to see the calming, and I think most of the neighbors are going to be glad to and welcome this exciting news. And I pass the letters out for you guys if if it's going to hold you up. I pass the letters out to the neighbor, Katie. Katie and I do it. Okay. And you know I will. I'll talk to everybody. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you much. Uh, any comments, questions here, Ms. Beringer? Glad to see it happen. It's certainly, okay. Mr. Daniel. Item right, two. I just had a question about the proximity of that middle one to that there's a stop sign there at Buckingham isn't there and it stops pool traffic it it seems it, it just seems a little close to the stop sign um, 
thumb. Yes, it could be. So rule of thumb is we want them at least 100 feet from an intersection, um, 100 feet from a stop sign, I guess, from a non-stopped intersection. It can be a little bit closer. Um, so that's where I placed this one was about at that 100 foot mark. Okay. Um, we could move it a little bit further. We're kind of just trying to space them if as best as possible. Rule of thumb, it needs to be. It's scaling right. is kind of hard, you know, right. seeing from the map. But yeah. that, that answers my question. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mr. Vance, anything? No question. It's good to see it coming in. Okay. So let's see. I don't think we need to take a formal vote on this, do we? No, I don't believe so. I think just looking for yes. guidance to move forward with including it in resurfacing this year, and that's what we'll do. Look at that, Mayor. You can get five thumbs up. You don't have to worry about making about some, taking that, three, yeah. four questions. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, we don't, don't even have to use the term consensus, right? So, thank <laughs> well, you very I'm much, uh, Ms. Harris. You're welcome. We appreciate thank you. the work you're doing. Okay. All right. Um, item number four, I recognize our town manager. Yes, Mayor, Town Council, um, your agenda, the item uh, agenda schedule uh, was included, uh, I guess, in reaction to uh, concerns from council members about the um, how far in advance of meetings they receive the agenda. And um, I attached in here a presentation we did, um, I think it was back in 2020, was it 2020? August 2020, yep. Um, where we covered this item and talked about the process of getting the agenda together and the review and actual compiling the information. And so I just put that in there as a matter of reference, but I, I believe um, Council Member um, Dellinger and perhaps I know Council Member Behringer have expressed concerns about that. And so we're just here to listen to any comments you have, um, any new information you want to share, any other concerns you want to share and just respond to that. I had not planned to go back over this information again. I'll start um, just um I think getting it Wednesday is I ideal for two reasons that are actually absent, not related to us even getting it. One is in our town ordinance. So we have meetings on Mondays or Tuesdays. Town ordinance section 221 under agenda says any person or group desiring any matter to be heard by the town council showed no later then Wednesday preceding each regular meeting of the council, submit to the town manager a brief request. That, it, that applies in the sense that they need to get it on the agenda or even have it a chance to, there needs to be a little bit more window. More specifically on the UDO in section 4.6.1, rezoning map amendment and under text amendments under 4.63, in addition to comments provided in person at the public hearing, any resident or property owner in the town may submit a written, st written statement regarding the proposal to the town clerk at least two business days prior to the proposed vote on such a change. So if for there to be two business days, so that people have to have access to the agenda to provide feedback on an item on the agenda, there need to be at least two business days before the meeting. And so when you, if it comes out on a, late on a Thursday and we have a Monday meeting, debatably there's not two business days there. So the Wednesday gives, us, gives the residents that buffer to see the agenda and if they have feedback that they can't be there but they want it to be included, they have that opportunity. Um, the only other feedback I had was, I think it'd be helpful, I saw the slide, if the council would receive the draft of the agenda that goes to the staff meeting because at the end of the day the agenda is the council's agenda that the staff is preparing so the sooner we can see it the sooner we can get feedback to you because i think that was the other issue was if it comes out late if we have a question and it comes out on late on a thursday there's only a Friday and maybe a Monday, if we're not meeting Monday, to uh, reach out to staff, a town attorney or a town manager or planning and, and get feedback on a question before it actually comes up during the meeting. Can you clarify when you say the, the agenda that the staff has? Do you mean just the paper copy? It won't have- as a concept. Okay, so when we have our agenda meeting- Right, if on you, you, 
there's some documentation or draft that goes into that meeting right and some draft that comes out mm -hmm. I think it'd be helpful if council could see what that is right okay once we go through it and determine what's right. going and what's so in like and what's if, out if yeah. yeah and so that even adds another some. maybe day or two where we can see it before the official one goes out and if we have something we need to add or if there's something that we're not understanding and it's just you know include us in the email of whatever draft is going out um so then the onus is on us to look at it and do with it what we want you know if we don't want to look at it we don't have to but if we do we kind of have a, a, an idea and sometimes in the process of getting ready for the meeting some of those things do change so as long as but that, that's realization fine. of and, that and um the last point on that was making sure that what's in gets presented at council is in the agenda packet it, there have been instances recently where the, what's being presented so the slides and i think what maybe what's happening i could be wrong is that the the agenda set so a development's coming to us but the slide deck has not been created right it's not being created uh and so, a lot of times it's not going to be created until the first our first priority is getting the agenda packet together right. and all that information's in there so and, the and slides that's, that's the realignment yeah. that i think needs to happen is that those slides yeah. are in the agenda pack because what is happening is there are discrepancies between what's getting presented in the slides and what's in the agenda packet and that causes questions and also in preparation if there's more or less information in a slide than is in the agenda packet all the preparation that goes into preparing may not be answered or be answered in a different way um i'll, I'll let someone I, speak but that yeah was, and i kind of see the PowerPoint as staff's notes and way of presenting it in a precise and concise manner. And um, it's not always going to be ready by the time we, because we can't do both simultaneously. Like, for example, like if, for example, we end this meeting tonight. So basically, you would say for the meeting on um, Monday, we'd have to have everything ready by close of business tomorrow. Well, not starting now. I'm not saying we need to start right. now, but I'm saying the, the timeline for right. you need to align your timelines so that you can sub, then it's done. Like right. Once so on Wednesday, there shouldn't the slide should be done. Yeah. And if you need to move the agenda prep yeah. meeting to a Friday so that there's the Monday work day to, and Tuesday to get the slides done so that it can go in the agenda packet. I'm just saying that yeah. when you, there are errors that are, can occur in a presentation that are showstoppers and that's not good for us it's not good for applicants either right i agree um, with that yeah so yeah um yeah we'll have to look at that because i mean i think in essence what may happen is it's going to push everything out two weeks to the next meeting if we can't get it all together in that time period again that's why you move your meeting yeah. if you know what you have your agenda prep meeting sooner then you're like, okay, on Friday, we know this is what we're preparing the agenda to be. You can prepare those slides on a Monday, Tuesday, so that it's in there. I'm just trying to avoid yeah. what has happened yeah. kind of repeatedly. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not a, a, anybody's intention per se, but it's right. just, yeah. you know. Right. So, so yeah, uh, let, let, let me let other council members weigh in on that. Um, <coughs> you've heard Mr. Damien's uh, Mr. Dellinger's presentation, Ms. Beringer. Yes, I'm. Observation in, comments. In the past, I had asked if it could be prepared earlier. My biggest concern was when we have a Monday council meeting, and sometimes we didn't uh, get the agenda till Friday. It was kind of hard to get around and see all of the different places that were involved as far as real estate is concerned. Um, Thursday certainly makes it easier, but when the meeting's on Monday night, and um, in the past, as I said, sometimes, and I mean distant past, okay, <coughs> that we didn't get it until Friday. Uh, if you had a, a crisis over the weekend, then we weren't prepared at all when we came into the meeting Monday night. Uh, council wasn't, so that was my concern. Now, my question to you, Rodney, is it possible for you to get that d together and ready for us on Wednesday? I think I'm going to have to um, have a staff meeting and talk about that and talk about where we can increase our efficiency and change the schedule. Because it 
I mean, it concerns pretty much every department and primarily um, planning probably has the biggest um, burden there. And sometimes they are getting information from others. And so it, it's going to be tough, but you know, this is kind of the way we've been doing it since I've been here. That doesn't make it right. Doesn't mean it can't be changed, but it's, we need to look at it and just map it out and uh, see if there's some improvements that can be made. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Vance. No questions. And maybe at some point, well, I'd like you to do that. We to hear from the town clerk, who I know is very involved in that process, and it becomes a um, a rush rush and an arduous process at times because she doesn't get information until later sometimes. But it can bottle up at different junctures of the uh, of the agenda preparation, I guess. Just my comment. Mr. Singleton. Uh, the, the, the question is, to get it on Wednesday for the Monday meeting is to, what we're looking at. That's the issue of the two business days, right? Or get it on Wednesday for the Tuesday meeting. I say just get it on Wednesday, either meeting, so that it's consistent. Either, either either meeting, on Wednesday yeah. period, instead of Thursday. Because it could be late Wednesday afternoon or Wednesday. I mean, that's that's fine. Because mm -hmm. you still got on Tuesday meeting, you had three business days: Thursday, Friday, and Monday. Monday's different. I was just asking because at one time we kicked around about changing Monday meetings to Tuesday. I'm just yeah, that's uh, that was the one of the things. Work sessions used to be on Monday. They were yeah. the I was going to actually bring that up. That was yeah. yeah that was I mean, we had work sessions used to be the last Monday, and then when Sam Bridges mm -hmm. was here, he was a civitan and somebody else was, and so they were on Monday meetings, so we switched to Tuesday. So I'm just and I know sometimes coming off a weekend that might be beneficial to, to staff somewhat. I had no trouble with that. Long, I mean, I know we got this year's schedule adopted, but you can, we can get to a breaking point where you can change them can like, change you know, two months out or whatever y'all say by the law. But I had no trouble, and y'all may not like that either. Making them all on Tuesday. Uh, let, let me hear Mr. Got, Matthews. He's got a civic meeting on Tuesday. There we go. We just ru ruined that. It's civic club meeting on Tuesday. <laughs> civil now? I, I'm, I'm no, we'll let Phil go. Then we'll come back to that. I agree that uh, if you. Switch that first one to a Tuesday. That gives that kind of remedies the problem, is, is what I'm hearing to some extent. It gives yeah. you that extra time, and I'm fine with that also. It'll help. I don't know if it'll remedy I, I everything. It'll totally still, remedy it, but you know, it'll like give you, tonight when we come out of a meeting, like tonight, then that means the next day we got to have everything ready for it to go by the close of business, and that could be that could be tough. So. Unless, unless we delay it another two weeks to the next meeting, so. I think we some things are timely and um, may not be able to push two meetings out. I mean, two weeks out. So it depends on what it is. Error on the side of the highest quality presentation, it actually saves time because when you rush it, potentially it ends up getting kicked later or it causes more work so i think it'll be an adjustment period i mean we're not nobody's sitting here saying we're going to shift immediately i, I am in in favor of if we that first meeting moved to a tuesday and getting the agenda on wednesday i think creates a lot more breathing room i think having that monday is good um it's my opinion uh, yes but um, mr singleton were you directing a question to me i'm sorry if you did i didn't clearly i was hear. just i was just saying I mean, is the first Tuesday of the month an option for people? I don't know. It may not be. That's just what I was thinking. If with, with, with that, you know, it, it ain't got to be Wednesday afternoon. It could be Thursday at noon because you still got two full business days, Monday and Friday. And if you got it by roughly noon on Thursday, that's still plenty of time plus the day of the meeting. Rodney talks about kicking things back two weeks, and I understand that. But in the case of the work session, very rarely are we doing something that's going to change or affect a public hearing where you need to push it back. So I can see what you're saying. If there was something that we had to rush through here, like Ms. Jones said, that the information on the uh, set, on the uh, notification is too soon. Okay, we all understand that. It's going to be two more weeks. We get that. I don't think there's any. I don't know there's much in the work session that we have that we would have to do at the next meeting where it wouldn't be kicked back two weeks anyway. I mean, it wouldn't be on a normal schedule for two weeks anyway. And, and the only pushback I'd have on going for the Thursday versus the Wednesday is some, sometimes things happen, and so then you lose a day. And so if it's Thursday and you lose a day, then it's Friday. But if it's Wednesday and something happens, there's a crisis, or you, you've built in a buffer day, you know? Yeah, the, the second, the meeting at the second Tuesday, excuse me, Tuesday after the second Monday, Lord have mercy, 
uh, there would no, be nothing really pressing for a work session for the next week. There's not y'all really had the work session stuff pretty well laid out. Unless something Sometimes. off the wall comes up and we could add it to the agenda, it's it's not something we're going to vote on unless it's an emergency. In that case, you would tell us it's an emergency meeting. We would take care of it. But so there's not much that's going to be added to a work session agenda that would be affected by the second to the Tuesday after the third Monday. Uh, very rarely because we're not going to vote on most things. Why, why, don't, why don't we let uh, staff take this conversation here and you, you're hearing the request of council and um, um, have some further discussion who it impacts and how it impacts and bring us back a recommendation. Wouldn't that be reasonable? Mr. Mayor, if I could just make one more yeah. comment. I think um, that we all could uh, be mindful that staff has a heavy workload I think that this ch change needs to, to happen and be investigated but I know in my own personal experience uh, so many people because I work from home so many people think I don't work and we don't see what staff does every day all day long so I think we need to be mindful and respectful of their workload as we ask them to make these adaptations yep and so we'll go back and map it out and see what we can do to make changes um, we, so we were prepared to also talk about, you know, any changes to the meeting schedule. So the Tuesday one was one. And then the other thing we thought we'd throw out, or I'd throw out since we're talking about it, is there any, um, any support or any thought about having the work sessions during the day? Since you're not voting, it's more in, information. I think that's a lot of A lot of places do that. I think it's problematic for potential future councils if you have someone who is people who work all, I mean, well, you can be retiring soon. Um, but some people have jobs all day. Yeah, Raleigh, Wake County, a lot of places. A lot of places have their meetings during the day, and I'm yeah, I'm not throwing that out. But but the work session where it's more reports and information, it works for you know Wake County and. And, it's, and I know one of the arguments is maybe the public can't make it, but half the public probably can and half maybe can't. Maybe council members no, can't make it. I mean, no matter what you do, your <laughs> right. half is going to be able to make that it. That used to can. be at 730, then we went yeah. to 7, now we went to 6. Yeah. I mean, we, that, that one has been yeah. changed a lot. Right. And that was the other thing I was going to bring up. Is there? A, <laughs> how about if all the meetings started at 6, so we're not waiting around that extra hour right so <laughs> so it's a lot a lot to think about if, if we, we uh, want to it's only it will only be two days you know it'll only be two days because we're already at six on this one so it'll only be two meetings mm -hmm. it'll be easier on tuesday than it would be on monday on the first monday i'll say that <laughs> but anyway that's just me you got other people to consider for new council members if they know that you know when they sign up then I'm not in favor of work sessions during the day. Yeah. I'm in favor of the six o'clock start I like time. Six o'clock, yeah, I'm fine with that. Because it, even a long meeting's not going to go until, you know, it, it, that's better. I'd like six o'clock. I'm, I'm, I am flexible with it uh, re relative to meeting in, in the day because I said I will be joining the retired group pretty soon, so I'll be have that time available. <laughs> But, uh, and for, and, but taking into consideration that those who do work uh, and uh, who may be on the council in the future, I'm, I'm running under the assumption that the adjustment can be made to make those accommodations and considerations uh, during that time. But with this, with this council, possibly, I don't see an issue with it, uh, with, 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 with the adjustment in the times. If you're a retired engineer, we might have to um, help get you to help us put the um, agendas together. Re <laughs> retired. <laughs> So, so, Mr. Vance, are you, you you're agreeing that uh, starting all the meetings at 6 o'clock would be a, a reasonable idea? Yes, but for this council, yeah. yes. Okay. But for other councils, may not be. You know, other councils can change it, I guess, if they choose to. But, uh, well, I mean, yeah, I, I don't have a problem with it. Um, Let's do a unanimous but, thumbs up again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, but so so we're voting on a change of time right now. We, we're still going to ask staff to bring back some information about when the agenda has to be ready and available to council. Th that needs to be discussed a little bit more, I think, uh, with the town clerk and with others. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll we'll go back as a staff and um, see what 
if we can come up with a, a different schedule for those type of things and yeah. try to expedite it better. So, yeah. So. But am I here? I mean, we well. Need, we need a thumbs up on a change into Tuesday and 6 o'clock, right? Those are the two. Well, I, I, I thought we would just, uh, I, I thought the staff need to look a little bit more about, uh, you know, having all the meetings on Tuesday. Uh, I think we're. Oh, are you board, okay with yeah. that? Yeah. We're all we're thumbs good. up on that. I think we <laughs> tossed that around a little Sorry. bit. Sorry. We're good with and that. And then the 6 o'clock, <laughs> I think we're good. Okay. So, so, so two things. We, there's agreement on having all of our meetings. We'll still have three a month, I guess. That's what we've already. And, and those will all be on Tuesdays. Well, and I said we'll we'll have one every Tuesday. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no. All right. And they will all. You add some more holidays? <laughs> And they will all start at six o'clock. There's, there's staff likes that, council likes that. Uh, hey, I can no, we need wrong. to talk about when you we. You said you were going to let her talk. You better, or she'll get even with us when she calls. Well, well, you're, uh, that's the reason I wanted uh, the staff to take it back. And uh, you know, there may be other department heads okay. that uh, have some heartburn on this. I don't know. Yeah. We ought to consider them. Yeah, we need to talk about like when we want to implement that, though, because we do at least have to give seven days notice to make a change to a meeting, but. A change to the regular the schedule, regular schedule yeah. right? Right, but but we can start this one anywhere beyond the seven days, it doesn't have to be yeah. at March okay. first. It, the new schedule could be adopted then on the 21st meeting, okay? So, again, I mean, I'm not gonna prolong it, but Mr. Manager and all of you feel comfortable in agreeing to this without having further conversation with other department heads and others who everybody be impacted by it some some more than others yeah i think the majority of folks that present Better. and have the most burden for the meetings is most of us are in the room so I there's think one so. sitting back there yeah. two sitting back there yeah he so gave me a home earlier yeah he gave me a thumbs up yeah. <laughs> yeah because for a lot of our staff they're they're staying here right. yeah you know, and they're staying here for a couple of hours past their normal right for a seven o'clock start so in in almost every situation it helps staff okay Anything else? Ms. Town Clerk, Gentlemen. I'm going to give you an opportunity just to, I'm not putting you on the spot, but if you care to say anything uh, or comment, uh, she sits right outside my door and she, she, she helps me so the mayor has to be more cautious of not leaning on her too much for things that I need, which I've done. But, um, and, and right now it's, it's just her, she, her assistant, uh, the assistant, uh, of course we're going to hire another person, but right now it's not, but I'll give you an opportunity if you want to weigh in or not. I think I will um, work with the manager and try to okay. help with this. Sure. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, we can't implement it right away. So uh, bring back a recommendation, I guess, as to when. And we'll I guess start. we formally need to vote to change uh, the, the schedule <clears throat> that we already approved for the, uh, for the coming year, right? Yep. Yeah, okay. All right. Was there anything else, sir? Oh, that's it. Unless, uh, did I miss anything? Either Assistant Manager John or Jody? Okay. See, there wasn't none about town tonight, right? Or is that what it's called? Talk of town. Talk yeah, of not, the town. Not, not this meeting work session will be the second regular meeting. Okay. On the twenty-first. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go to uh, council reports. Uh, well, we skipped over manager reports. The item we just talked oh, about was a regular agenda. I'm item. sorry. So You're right. The manager was reporting, so <laughs> in my mind it was. Go ahead. Um. So the first item is the pending agenda you have in your packet. Um, one thought was if you look at the February schedule. Uh, knowing that we also have a retreat in February on the 23rd and 24th. Um, there was some thought that maybe council might want to skip the Tuesday, February 28th work session, since that Thursday and Friday prior to that, we would have had a two day retreat. And right now we don't have anything scheduled on that meeting. But, but that's up to you. We'll Let's say you follow your direction on that. Yeah. That's fine. It's fine. Me. Okay. Thumbs up on that one, uh, Mr. Man. Bring me a birthday cake on the twenty-first, right? Hmm. <laughs> Store bought. I'm not okay. going. Is that good? <laughs> I'm not going to ask for cake. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, you have in there a Greater Triangle commuter rail. Oh no, you don't. Actually, don't have that. 
Yes. It's at our desk here. This yeah. Announcement. Yeah, we do. At your desk. Um, just to open house to gather more information. That's going to be February 16th uh, at the Garner Senior Center, and it's to uh, join the discussion around the Greater Triangle Commuter Rail. Yeah, you go ahead, John. Um, Mayor Council members, you may have seen an article in the newspaper. There's been several recently, but what I'm specifically listed, the public engagement opportunities. Um, they Go Triangle was still trying to work out a location and a date for the Garner one when that list came out. So you didn't see it in that list. It was added after that. So Mr. Mercer and others were trying to, to work to get that information pushed out because it wasn't that date wasn't known when the the newspaper article was out. So any help you can give in getting that word out, please do. Um, and is Go Triangle the one that's uh, sponsoring this discussion? Okay. Thank you. All right. The other item I had was just, um, I didn't receive any other feedback on the council retreat agenda, so I'm taking it that it's, it's good as presented, but just so you don't have it in front of you. Um, and why don't we say what's the drop dead date if you, if you want to make any if you get any suggestions well, for changes sure you need to do it right away oh, okay so this is it best, okay before we take time to put the information together that's not already together just wanted to get that in front of you that this is the um this will be the okay. final agenda uh, we have a couple of guests coming in um we talked about on Friday, we will have um, someone come in and talk about the uh, Smart Cities Initiative, um, <coughs> Mr. Steve Rao, and um, that will be 12 o'clock on um, right. Friday. Friday, yep. But other than that, all else would stay the same. So, so him coming in at lunch doesn't actually change our schedule any. All right. And then the last item I had was I'm going to turn over to Jody sure. for that announcement. Uh, good evening, Mayor, members of Council. I've got some exciting news to share with you. I forwarded it to your email, but uh, the Senior Center has been named the State Sorry. Senior Center of the Year. Yes. So we're very excited about that. Um, the Senior Center has earned the seventh annual Ann Johnson Senior Center uh, award for excellence in the field of aging and this is awarded by the North Carolina Senior Center Alliance and it's to honor senior centers that have made significant contributions that address and elevate issues of important to the field of aging and make a positive impact affecting older adults so we're super thrilled that our um, our senior centers being recognized um, two of the areas they highlighted for the recognition were um, focused on our Meals on Wheels programming and the congregate meals that are served there and how important that is to, to the community. Um, but they also recognized our Gardening for Life program as sort of a new initiative, that community garden that's in the, the back uh, patio area as, sort, as a new sort of innovative way to engage our seniors at the Senior Center. So wanted just to bring that to your attention. If you see our teams at Parks and Rec or the Senior Center, please say congratulations to them. It's a big honor. And that's it, Mr. Manager. Thank you so much. That, that's great news. Um, and if I might add to that, I believe when, when uh, Congresswoman Ross was here that she told us that we serve more meals out of our senior center, more meals on wheels than any other location in Wake County. That's my understanding. That's, that's quite that's a, understanding. an accomplishment, quite an achievement. I hope that's a true statement. I, that was included. By the way, your mayor is, has done a... With uh, Rick and uh, Kyle's assistance, uh, sort of a state of the town, that will include a uh, good video of things from last year, and that certainly was one of the things that was mentioned there for sure. So uh, it's an active center and uh, helps a lot of people, I'm sure. Okay, Mr. Manager, that's anything all I else? Have. I wasn't trying to. No, that's it. Push that's okay. All, right. all right. Uh Thanks. Council reports, Mr. Matthews. Well. Uh, the assistant manager took my sizzle. I was going to do that, so I will yield back <laughs> okay. to her, and that's all I had, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Great job, by the way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Singley. Yeah, the, the Meals on Wheels, which we've been doing over there for years, I think you still deliver them, right? We do, yeah. We do, and uh, they got five, we got five routes, and anywhere from 8 to 12 meals usually is what you deliver, and you may do more. I don't know. That's what 19, mine, yeah. You did 19 on yours? Yeah. Uh, my last one was 12. Ice was 13, so anywhere from 8 to 19 uh, meals, plus the people who eat there. Uh, so it's uh, when you go there to get your meals, it's, it's hopping. 
Um, <laughs> it's changed quite a bit since COVID. You know, they, they don't do some of the things they did, they did since then, but it's really a busy activity center. <clears throat> and, you know, the, the people who've been there some time and they get their meals and, and socialize, and many of them then go home because that's their only social interaction of the day. So it's a great program. They're looking for volunteers. Mr. Vance is now retired, and he can fill in for a day, do a route one day a month. Soon to be retired. Soon to be, there you go. <laughs> Soon to be retired, Mr. Vance, okay. But anyway, um, it, it is a you know, great center. It's hard to believe. Not many people in this room know how the senior center started. But Ms. Hudson. Ms. Hudson and a group of other citizens went to the town council and said, we want one, and the town, the town board turned them down and said no. So they got really wound up. And Ms. Hudson leading the charge, I can assure you, they were really wound up. Mm -hmm. And so the deal was they would, the town would give them the land if they could get the building built. And the senior center was built through donations. They had uh, barbecue dinners, chicken dinners, yard sales out the toot and tell it in, in the parking lot, whatever it took. And she would come back in the store when I was working at the store and smiling and say, guess what I did today? I said, there's no telling. All the HVAC is being donated, the equipment and the time to install it. Another time it would be the roof. Another time it would be the plumbing. A lot of that was donated to build that. So as a group of citizens, she was just she was the leader, and uh, not many of those people are around anymore. But they started that. It was the only it was the first senior center in Wake County, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a town. The town used to have an, a uh, uh, there's a house there that they used for a, rec, a parks and rec office to go to registration and everything. And it was the Whitaker house, Miss Whitaker's house they had bought. And so they moved that and, and another house and then uh, about three properties to build the center. And of course, you know, the, the first part was just the main part. Then the other part was from a, the bond referendum in 2001. And I think that I part of in 2000, that. about 2005 or 2006, Mayor mm -hmm. Lee was the manager. Yep. So it's uh, got quite a history. It's been around over 30 years. So anyway, I'll pass that along. It is a great center. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Uh, Ms. Berenger. I just have a few things. Um, 1412 Vendora Springs Road is the, the house that looks so bad that we all wish they would clean it up. Well, now they've stretched, expanded to 1410 Vendora Springs Road. There are several cars in both yards as well as all the garbage and debris and so forth around the house and in front of the, in the carport. Um, so if we could look into something that we might be able to do to minimize that, but I mean, they're not shrinking their footprint, they're growing it. Um, and then 1201 Lakeside Drive looks like a haunted house. Uh, it's empty and covered with, it's got some debris under the carport if you can see it, but it's mostly covered with vines um, and overgrowth and that needs to be attended to. It's, just, it's very scary looking and, and uh, not, uh, in compliance and there is a car <laughs> in the yard at 206 West Garner Road uh, it hasn't moved in years looks terrible and I'm thinking it's probably just neglected it needs to be hauled away um, but the, the most fun thing I want to talk about today is that last Friday I had the privilege of attending Dr. George Debnam's funeral um, Dr. Debnam was a just an outstanding individual. He was an OBGYN uh, doctor in Raleigh for years and years and years. He was 95 when he passed away early last week. And he spent his time taking care of people. Uh, he went to Shaw University when he was 15 years old and then went on to medical school and came back and gave back to, to the town. He was from, I believe, Franklin County. And uh, he came and gave back to the town. He had three daughters, two of them, a uh, pair of twins. They became doctors. And when Dr. Debnam was about 85 years old, he called his twin daughters who were practicing at Harvard and said, I'm retiring. It's time for you girls to come home. And they did. And they moved his practice from Blunt Street to Pool Drive and New Bern Avenue to carry on his legacy. Uh, there's seldom been many people that I have admired that much and uh, just saw, he just gave his whole life, he loved giving his life to caring for people. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that. If anybody would like to see his picture and the, read the, uh, the um, account of his life, you know, I'll be happy to share it. And that's all. Thank you. Very honorable gentleman. Mr. Rebe uh, Dellinger. Mr. Vance. Yes, I would like to echo what has been said about the Garner Senior Center. Um, 
as I mentioned earlier, in building the Hope Park, I never went into it until the unfortunate tragedy of the explosion at, um, at Conagra, in which uh, Conagra used that as a location for staging and doing their, their outreach and other activities there. And it was just amazing to, get to become acquainted with the senior center and see how active the seniors were in there, not only with Meals on Wheels, but also with gardening programs and other activities and, and exercising classes as well. Uh, so it's good to hear that, uh, that the award that the, that the senior center has received. And I just want to also say that, um, that one thing I have in reference to uh, citizens' concern is in reference to the intersection of uh, US 70 and New Ran Road. Uh, there is uh, been brought to my attention that the timing on the Sunday Sundays is t seems to be longer for the New Ran Road portion of uh, that intersection. So if we can have somebody possibly look at the timing for that for that light there, it would be would be appreciated. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. You mean the red light for the the red light? Yes, okay. the timing on the red light. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going next, but go ahead. You got something? Yeah, before you go real quick, I had one more announcement. That just on behalf of the Garner Historical Society, um, they're putting together a display for uh, Black History Month. And this month, they're going to focus on Meadowbrook. So they'll have some information on Meadowbrook and some of the um, items we were able to um, gather and um, show for their exhibit. So just want to mention that. I know they've got a real old golf wood three wood, I guess it is, or something that uh, has been placed over there, I think. So uh, at any rate, it's a yeah. piece of history. Um, I don't usually uh, complain about the roads, but um, at any rate, uh, on Aversboro Road, it's essentially that section that's right across from the YMCA. It's not a typical pothole, but there's a, there's a, it's a sort of a rectangular spot that's uh, the pavement's gone or whatever. I try to always miss it when I'm going home, but invariably I've hit it a bunch of, it's just kind of a jolt. It I, looks like it could be maybe patched pretty easily, but I'm not saying put that a priority over anything else. But uh, anyway, if somebody could look at that, it'd be great. And then the uh, other thing I would mention, I've had some discussions with the town manager about um, maybe uh, uh, now's a good time to think about reorganizing our dais the same way that it was designed for. Uh, and having uh, some of our staff join us up here as they did before. The attorney used to sit right over there. Um, I think it gives them better view of the audience and even as they're speaking, the audience can hear better. Um, but um, I wanted to mention that to council. Um, obviously we did this for social distancing and other reasons. And even if, if we use those spaces the way they were designed, I don't think we'll be that close together, but um, we don't necessarily have to uh, to decide that tonight. Anything else you want to mention on that, Mr. Manager? No, I think you covered it all. Okay. Thanks. All right. So think about that and... Uh, uh, well, one thing I would mention, I think in the configuration that the, the clerk will have some discussion about it, but I think she prefers to stay where she is for convenience of swearing people in and... Well, let's talk to her about it a little further. She may prefer to be right yeah. up here. Okay. Yeah. All right. Where she was before or where her predecessor was before. Okay. And that means, uh, let's see. Predecessor, she's been the clerk the whole time we've been in this building. Well, I wasn't talking about it in this building. I was just saying, well, okay, you're right. She need a Sorry fresh stool back. Somebody Sorry. Are we Strike that well, word from the here. lexicon there. Yes. Okay, um, you're right. Yeah, <clears throat> follow up, you mentioned a, a pothole. Fifth Avenue, <clears throat> right in front of on the, the, the buildings down there. It's almost in front of the Diamond Cuts Barbershop. There's one I think patched it before and it's come again that was full of water today and with the cold temperatures this weekend with the rain we're having, I'm afraid it's going to pop and get even bigger. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and for those uh, of you who may not know, uh, our new congressman is going to have a sort of a ribbon cutting office opening on Friday, I believe at 12 noon. And uh, don't forget Groundhog's Day. Uh, we'll get a prediction from I believe the, the, the new uh, groundhog is not snurred anymore. I think I heard it might be a, a different name. But anyway, that'll be, if you get a chance to come by White Deer Park around noontime, we'll, we'll get your prediction for the next six weeks, I guess. Sir Walter Wally has retired, so Raleigh's not going to have a groundhog. That's what year. I've heard, yeah. So we may be the only game in town. No, not really. 
Okay, um, I think we're finished with all our business, and uh, awesome. it's now a good time to. Right. Anything else from down there? Okay, I declare this meeting of the town council to be adjourned.